Hello, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Nice to have you here. Thank you for stopping by the show. As always, we are driven by your questions, and you can enter them by going to officehours.global, or you can use the QR code that pops up during the course of the show. If you want to get more involved, you can use Mukana. That's our back-end system that lets you not only add questions, but vote on those questions, because the questions with the most votes, well, that's what we prioritize here in the show. Today, we're going to have two full hours of Q&A, so if you have any production or IT-related questions, feed them into the system and we'll do our best to answer them. And we'll go until we run out of your questions so you control a lot of the stuff that happens during the show. Right now, we're ready to start, so let's dive in. Uh, Alex, what's our first question this morning? Our first question is from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington, and Guy asks, uh, what's new in Blackmagic's camera 8.6 public beta? Okay, so there's a new update. And Alex, I, have you had enough time to look at some of the stuff and figure out what's in the new new release? Yeah, I think that I think that the reason that it's a public beta is because they changed so many things that I, they're like, well, yeah, we better let people actually play with this a little bit. You might not want it to turn it right on, um, but it looks really impressive. So if you look at this here, um, you've got uh, a lot of really interesting things. So um, support of the camera as a as a webcam or UVC, so you can actually. Uh, plug. It looks like you can plug the camera straight into your computer. That's been something you know a lot of other folks have been doing. So it, it's kind of important. Um, you know, the it has a media pool file browser, which is interesting. Um, but you know, uh, Blackmagic Cloud updates REST command API control for the, the cameras, and this is for all of these cameras. So um, so the um, so that's that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, the, you know, SMB uh, sharing support, uh, you know, improved USB-C, but these are the big ones here. The ability to, you know, act as a web camera, you know, upload to, to the cloud, REST, these are all really, really great features. Bravo, like to, 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 um, to, to Blackmagic. I just, you know, we'll, we'll install it on some of our cameras and see how it works. <laughs> but, you know, like it may be a little, what I would say is it's really impressive. It will probably take a little bit of testing to iron out the sharp edges. Um, but I think that um, Blackmagic has, has made a, and I, and I think that this really speaks to what Blackmagic does well, which is that we're not going to require you to buy a new, new camera at all the time. We'll just keep adding features because it makes sense to add those features to the product. And I think that they've done a great job. Building out the ecosystem. Chris Fenwick. For the possible people that don't understand or don't know, what does rest control mean? Now, it just means that you'll have a you you can there's rest is a is a um, protocol that we use in a lot of different places to um, it, to basically control devices so uh, when we want to send out um, you know send out commands so there'll be a, there's a whole library there we'll be able to make calls so we'll be able to start record stop record probably do you know autofocus uh, change settings and I don't know how deep that API will go but for instance uh, if you look at like the AJA FS HDRs everything is rest like we can control it just almost everything via rest um, commands uh, into that and so a lot of pl appliances especially in broadcast use rest as the protocol to talk back and forth and so so it's going to be really interesting to see it just means that we could build a lot of really interesting um, solutions that talk to the camera this means we could I mean to put it in perspective we could shade your camera eventually um, from uh, um, we could eventually shade uh, your camera remotely. So, cool. yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Blackmagic continues to improve their products. Let's go on to our next question this morning. Next question is from Scott Wasserman in Detroit, Michigan. And Scott asks, it's been a while since I've used Zoom ISO. I noticed that there is now a capture op mode option with two options, live stream or record. There is a good explanation in the documentation, but I'm curious uh, which option people are choosing and what are the pros and cons? Um, I don't use Zoom ISO. I know, much, I know we use it on the show. And Alex, have you explored any of this to figure out? I don't know if, yeah, I, I have to admit that I'm um, I'm a little like I, I was, it may be there and I just haven't paid much attention to it. <laughs> so yeah. so I'm, I'm opening it up right now just to see um, where. Definitionally, it would see the oh, live stream as if you're not going off directly a hard drive or things like that. But maybe if so you can't do the, both at the same time. Yeah, here's the, um, what he's talking about is this right here, capture mode. So mine's set to record. <laughs> I haven't needed to do anything else. Uh, capture mode can be live stream or record. I'm sure maybe Andy will tell me in the back end. But, but the, um, I've never changed it between live stream and record, so I'm not entirely sure what it does because I haven't needed to. I mean, I use this every week um, so for, for one of the shows that we do. And so I, but I haven't, uh, and we use it obviously in the, in the 
um, uh, for uh, office hours, but I'm not sure what the difference is between those two settings. Next time he's on, we'll have to keep that as a question in the background. We'll get the source from directly inside Zoom. Uh, let's go on to our next question. Uh, next question is from Douglas Carmichael. And Douglas asks, uh, if I'm going to build my studio around Dante, would it be worthwhile to use hardware a hardware interface like a Yamaha RUIO 16D to connect my MacBook Pro to the network instead of DVS? And uh, Nigel Dessau is going to start us off, Nigel. So I looked at the device, and I don't see whether it has a clock in it or not. So every Dante network requires a clock. Uh, now, you can, with DVS, use the computer to provide the clock, but generally people recommend you don't. So we've got to really start with an external clock. The cheapest way into an external clock that I can think of is probably one of these Avios, which gives you a really good basis um, this is an Avio that connects to XLR, but you can get USB ones. And we really need two devices to do anything. And so um, I think DVS is a very good way at, uh, to get sound out of your, your MacBook and into whatever you're doing with your Dante. I, I will tell you, though, that the trick is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the network. And you're going. To, there's another question coming in a minute. We'll talk about some of the things to go and test. But you need to make sure it's on a separate network and a solid external clock. And I don't know whether that device has that clock. I couldn't see one. And we have a note here in uh, our chat. Mickey uh, popped in with the fact that every Dante-capable device can generate a clock, including the Rios. So you should have a clock available to you. Uh, so hopefully that will take care of your problem, Douglas. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul asks... Uh, what video editing app best imports a Google Photo slideshow and makes it into a production, Mac and PC? Chris Fenwick's going to start us off here. Chris? Look, I hate to be that guy who says, hey, I don't know anything about this, but I want to talk anyway. But I don't know anything about this, and I want to talk anyway. Um, I, I will say this. In general, and I realize this makes me sound super old, but in general, I find these... I need to do everything magically, just automatically. What button do I push? Questions. Uh, kind of annoying. I mean, th there might be <laughs> there might be a way to do it, but just I mean, sometimes you just have to work. That's what work is, and especially in the editing. And Bill, you've probably heard this. People will ask a question. It's like, well, how do I automatically do all that stuff? You hire an editor, or you learn the craft, and then you go and you do it. Sometimes you just have to work. I will say it's not very hard to do these, and uh, let's let Alex weigh in on this. And if Alex doesn't go in this direction, I'll finish up with a little bit of wisdom about it. Alex? Yeah, it depends on um, I the the sli I'm assuming what you're saying is the slideshow is breaking it up and is giving you four ups and three ups and two ups and doing all these little fun things that it does. And the problem really is is any kind of fades and animations in a in a browser oftentimes don't aren't frame for frame. So you 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 tend to they look great when you're thinking about them until you actually output those as an edit um so so the and one of the challenges you'll have is that any kind of screen record that that, that takes that if, it, if you're trying to screen record what google's doing in slides um it is going to also affect the frame rate of the playout and so those are the you know if if that's what you're doing now if you're just going slide to slide to slide to slide to slide um the best tool to use with a slideshow is to export them all out and drop them into an editor like final cut and then set select them all and say fade <laughs> you know like so so there's a lot of different ways that you can you know there's or iMovie or lots of other things on I don't know how to do it on PC um but but the uh but I think that uh but the the challenge you really get into is um the quality of the frame rate uh coming out of a browser is limited guy yeah, we ran into this during a, a funeral. Uh, we had to put together some some uh, quick uh, uh, older photos and slam it in. And it, it's better to have control over how long you the duration of that still that you want on. So things like Google Photos, if you just kick it out, it's going to have the timing and pacing. And it, if you're using specific music, it's not going to be in line. So what a lot of people do is export everything individually, 
use something simple, um, Keynote, PowerPoint, uh, to get those individual slides. And there's, there's tricks. You can watch YouTube videos as to how to get each one of those really fast. So if you have 100 pictures, you can export them all as individ individual JPEGs, drop them all in and create 100 slides and then do a really fast transition in between them. And then you can then take it into something like Final Cut or iMovie is what we wound up, uh, the person that I was working with works for Apple. So she's really well versed in in um, in uh, uh, iMovie. And so once we figured out the timing, I grabbed the music, just used Downey, grabbed some music off of YouTube, slammed it in there. And then she was able to get that pacing and those uh, moves that she wanted at the right hits that she wanted. So that, that's the fast way to me if you're on a Mac is this photos over to over to iMovie. So that's what I would do. Alex is coming back in. Alex? And I'm pretty sure that Oliver Breidenbach is, is yelling at the screen right now. Um, he has a, he's a piece of software that's called Photomagico, which is, does this really well. <laughs> so, so Photomagico uh, is, is another one that you probably want to check out. He'll kill us if we don't mention it. I don't have as much. I don't do that many slide, slides like this, so I haven't used it heavily. But it's pro I've talked to people who have used it for a lot of their events. And they just love it. The people who use this, um, this is designed, whether it's video or audio, to kind of build those kind of frames and gives you a relatively smooth interface to just kind of throw them together. It's probably the best, um, on a Mac, the best solution between photos and a and Final Cut, you know, or, or iMovie or, or something like that. So Photomagico is from Boink's software. Chris Fenwick? Oops, you're a lot muted, quieter Chris. than we expected. And, and if anybody's interested, just let me know. I will show you how to take 50, 100, 20, whatever it is, images, put them into Final Cut, put dissolves between all of them, put little Ken Burns effects moves, be done with the whole thing, and I can do it in probably two minutes. A whole slideshow, 100 slides, done. So it's not hard. Where's the video? You're gonna put. You're gonna make that video, and you and we'll put it on office hours. So Chris is gonna make the video for us and show us how to do it in two minutes. What's the to do it? I, I to do need it. to know what's the shortest length a video can be in YouTube because I might have to stretch seven it. seconds. <laughs> okay. Anyway, There's actually I think, most I think of I've the seen tools. Videos, so you can you can but but you can uh, isn't that called Vine? Yeah, exactly. You, know, you can put really, really, I, I saw a video the other day on, on YouTube that just said three seconds. I'm like, really? And I turned it on and it was pretty funny, actually. It was a pretty good video for three seconds. Um, so all the major NLEs will allow you to do this. It's not particularly hard to do. And if all you want to do is slap slides on a timeline and then uh, batch change them all to a particular duration and then throw a transition between them, super easy. And you can do them with almost all of these. To me, the the commercial projects that I've worked on that has, usually there's an art director involved and they're very specifically about how they want things done. And they may comp it in a slide program that does those kind of boxes and they're dropping things in there. They may use a template. They may do it custom. To me, what I have learned is I almost always do complete recut of the show in Final Cut to match what they've done. And it takes about a tenth the time that they took because they were making decisions about how they wanted the images to appear at what time. Once those decisions are all made, the actual recreation of that in any of the NLEs will be much faster than taking the time to decide how to do it. So for me... The key is spending that time up front to make a beautiful show. Uh, the templates show you that. What you just saw with those templates, somebody who has a good artistic eye laid things out in a way that's very pleasing. That's kind of different than just throwing a bunch of slides up and just making one after the another take place at a half second interval or whatever. But you should be able to do this and everything. And Paul, I wish you good luck and have fun doing it. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas asks, I'm getting a Yamaha DM3D as a compact on-ramp uh, to the Dante world. I've taken all three Audinate courses, and would, and would but what would some Dante skills I could practice with a simple Dante network of the DM3 and the MacBook Pro running DBS? Now, Joel, help him out. So I can tell you what I did, uh, and someone like Mickey would probably give you better test streams than I, I could, but the first thing you have to do is test your network. So you've got to make sure the network is right and it's secured and, and probably everything's running on a separate network. So I'll tell you what I did. First, I tried to get something out of DVS from my Mac, from one Mac into my mixer. Then I had to learn to use the routing of the mixer to get something out of the mixer, either back to that Mac or to a different Mac. And then I tried moving things both ways between things. 
Then I added a third device in, an Avio, to mix that. And so what I tried to do was not try to do too much at once, but do one additional thing, make sure it worked, look at the network, make sure the network, look at the response time I was getting uh, from, on the controller to make sure, and, and slowly build it up. My advice is don't try and do too much too soon because what happens is unless you're really good, and you, I did the, the uh, courses as well, but the difference between the practical and, and you know theory and the practical is the reality of it. So just, just keep doing one step, add one thing at a time, see what impact that has on the network. You may find your network becomes the critical point of failure in the implementation. Sounds like good advice. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York. And Zach asks, uh, I have the option of completely rebuilding my home studio and I will incorporate Final Cut, Dante, NDI, 2i2 Focusrite, X32 Rack, and my existing NAS. Uh, what other toys and cool treasures should I be looking at? I have a gigabit network as well. Oh, congratulations. And we are sorry. You get to completely rebuild your studio. So there's a lot of work ahead. Nigel's going to start you off with some advice. So I don't know what you want to do in your network with your live streaming or just editing, but I, 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 the three things that struck me and you sort of answer it right at the end is make sure you have a good network. Network is, is the key to moving, particularly with the NDI stuff um, or the uh, ordinate stuff. You really need to get a, a virtual LANs in place that allow you to protect that either by using, you know, a Netgear AV router or just being smart with your virtual gears, uh, virtual LAN. So I would I would make sure that was the thing is, I'm not a big fan of the focus rights. I wasted a, a three weeks of my life on one of those and went to a mix pre, but if you have it, that's fine. Um, again, I don't know if you you need mics and lights and cameras and stuff like that. I'm we have lots of advice on that. The other funny thing that, I, that was missing on this list for me was some speakers and some headphones. And that in my little studio connected to my X32, I just put some uh, KRK five inch speakers, which aren't great, but they're good enough for what I need to do with a good pair of headphones if I need to get into more detail. Uh, let's go to Guy Cochran, Guy. Yeah, as, as Nigel was saying, I was going to recommend one of the Netgear M4250 switches. Ideally, you would start to get into a 10 gig, 10 gig uh, atmosphere where uh, the port, the farthest one can be a SFP module, and that one you can plug in a fiber or a, um, a, a copper uh, 10 gig uh, uh, SFP module. And then from there, it would be nice to have your, your NAS uh, on the 10 gig. It depends on what you're throwing around, but if you're doing 4K on NDI, you're going to want that extra bandwidth. And then I, I love the Ubiquiti Dream Machine Pro to be able to granularize and create uh, VLANs and just be able to see what's going on and monitor my network and control who's who's got how much bandwidth so I can allocate and say, hey, you're only allowed uh, you know, one gig for your connection, you're, you're two and a half gig. And that way I can monitor, but also control what uh, I have fi finite and granular control as long as I have layer three switches instead of the VLANs. But yeah, save yourself a ton of hassle by having these profiles that are in the 4250 because otherwise you're going to tear your hair out um, trying to get the stuff to flow correctly. Alex Lindsay. Amazon Prime. <laughs> so, so, so here's the same. Don't try to buy too much before you uh, before you need it. So uh, that, that's you know whether you're buying from Amazon or B and H or your local uh, you know um, reseller. Uh, the the thing to do is to be build organically. Figure out what you want to do. Start adding things together. Um, having them break. Like I as I build things, I generally am more. You can always tell when I'm building because. Uh, there are packages arriving every day in little increments. Like I buy something and I go, oh, that isn't quite right. Or this isn't, you know, I'm going to buy a bunch of different cables of this length or I'm going to buy a bunch of things here. And I organically build up exactly what I need. I don't buy a lot of things up front. Um, I try to give myself enough ramp time. It doesn't sound like you're on a deadline. So if you're not on a deadline, you, um, you know, buy things incrementally. Keep on adding them piece by piece and make sure that they're there. It's very easy for you to design a system before you know what it needs to do and then the system will define define itself as opposed to you defining it you want the the mission to define this the the system not the system to define the mission and so if you start buying a bunch of gear up up, up, up ahead of time um you are getting ahead of that and the and the system will start to define itself and it'll just start to define what you can do with it so what i do is i look at what i'm trying to do 
and I keep building, you know, and I keep on looking at, okay, I'm going to buy this piece. I'm going to buy this piece. And B, you also have to be fairly um, uh, non-dogmatic about it, like be willing to throw things away to move on to the next thing. And so I've got a lot, I got a pile of things that I don't use anymore. And sometimes I use them only a couple of times. And then I'm like, well, this is, you know, th there's a better solution, you know, here. So, so anyway, so I would, I would approach it organically. Jeff Keith Lee, you've done a few of these kind of things, haven't you? Just a few, just a few. I, my, my best suggestion is going to be exactly what uh, Nigel alluded to and also Guy. Uh, if you don't have a good network infrastructure and gigabit is not really a you know, telling sign of what the network is. So a switch that's an M4250 series that you can truly know that the profiles are what they're supposed to be for Dante and there and set up your VLANs if you want to segregate your traffic like that with a VLAN for Dante, a VLAN for EDI. That's the way we do it here. And it's just a game changer. Things just work and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And those switches could be purchased like a small eight port switch or 10 port switch could be done for like five or $600 usually. Um, I would personally go ahead and spend a little bit more in that realm, be around a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars in the budget to be able to do a larger switch with 10 gigabit capabilities, whether it's just a few uh, ports on it or something that's a larger one that you can do more ports for so that you're for the future prepared because you will want to grow into it. And there's nothing worse than hitting a brick wall whenever you just run out of resources physically in that. And then the other small thing that you might want to consider is like an led wall behind you instead of having just the same desktop all the all the time you got the same look you know you got the same stuff that's in the background it gets so old at times so sometimes you may just want to change and and whenever you do that it just opens up a whole lot of extra capabilities to small investment just a small investment so you mentioned Final Cut in here, so I'm going to assume you're doing any some kind of video or video and audio production inside of that. So just a couple of things from having built three now, or maybe it's four uh, studios in various places that I've lived, including the Hay Barn transition, that was a pretty big and complicated two-year design and build thing for me. Um, number one, I would make sure that you have adequate power there. I mean, you're not going to be able to run a second circuit into your house and things like that. That's usually beyond what people can do. But pay attention to that. Thankfully, equipment sips power rather than... Uh, grabs it in big gulps now that we're going away from incandescent. So you will need less. But pay attention to your wiring as you put things together. One of the smartest things I ever did in one of my studios was put the edit desk away from all the walls. If you have room from that, you will be happy for the rest of your life because you'll be able to get behind your equipment to repatch, to add new things. The less time you spend on your back underneath with a flashlight in your teeth trying to figure out why that cable needs to be replaced, the better. Uh, I noticed that Chris Widener had some really good things in there. He said a mini split AC, and I can't tell you how important it was for me in the, my middle studio to have AC outside of the room so I could keep open mics and keep working without a lot of air conditioning noise and a good chair. And I'm going to second that too because you're going to spend a lot of time sitting at the desk here. So do not stint on creature comforts. Alex wants to get back in, and so does Jeff Keithley. So Alex, take it away. Yeah, I was just going to build on what Bill said. You can always, I always know that someone has some, a fair bit of experience setting these things up when there's space between the the desk and the wall. You know, <laughs> like, you know, like, it's just always like, you know, I just never push things up against the wall unless it's got wheels that I can pull out and I build all the cables for it. Uh, but I, you know, the, you know, you climb behind the, under those things too often and you're like, uh, we're, and it's funny because we'll, you know, we have, we will stake out like we'll be working in an event and I'll say, well, I need this space. And they'll say, well, your tables aren't right up against the edge of that space. I'm like, yeah, because I need to walk back there. <laughs> like, you know, like, so, so I was like, you know, a, a table to me is, is, um, you know, typically about seven to eight feet because it's the chairs on one side and it's the space on the other. And I need that square for every, every table. So, yeah. Yeah, fairly. You don't often have that option. Sometimes you have to push things up against the wall in a small bedroom conversion or something like that. But if you can do anything else, put it across the corner, anything so you can get behind it. Jeff Keithley, more thoughts. I, I have my desk right up against the wall, guys, actually. But my desk is a sit-stand desk, and that was the best thing was investing in that. Not because I stand. I can't stand standing. I have a nice chair. But I like to raise it up, and I can roll my chair all the way underneath it and do all the wiring stuff I need to do, and then I roll back and put it down. And that's the most workout it gets. And honestly, it's a great investment just in if you want to be healthy, I guess, too. Yeah, whatever. 
Yeah, one last thing I'll note. Remember that you want to be able to see things, but you also want to be able to hear things. So depending on your room, uh, where you put the the speakers, if you're going to do a standard near field monitors on a desk kind of thing, if you're literally between two parallel walls, you can get standing waves and things like that. I always try, if I have the option, to orient my desk into a corner and a little off center so that the speakers are firing not into a flat plane surface that's going to bounce back at me, but in something that'll diffuse it at least a little bit. And wall treatment, but keep some money for that. Remember, you're not just going to be watching. You're probably going to be listening in this space. And uh, if it sounds good, you'll be happy. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. And Gordon asks, now that Blackmagic Pocket Cinema c- cameras have webcam functionality, can they be plugged into iPhones and iPads for use in Zoom? Oh, it'll be interesting to test. Jeffrey, any experience with this? I mean, it's so, today's release. <laughs> Yeah, th- but this is the short answer. iPhones, no. iPads, yes, but only with FaceTime. And if it's any consolation, Androids, you can't plug an external webcam into an Android either and have it work in, in anything. So the, uh, unless it's an endoscope and it's got its own app, that, that's the only camera I could ever see uh, or I've ever seen connect up to a phone. Otherwise, you can, uh, NDI has been do, doing some great strides. I use a program called Top Director to see my NDI feeds I could record. Can't go into Zoom with them either, but uh, it, that's the only other option that I'm seeing right now. Alex? I'm not sure if you can't go into Zoom. If it's, if it, if it's considered a UVC connection, it may be possible with Zoom. And if it isn't, it probably will be soon. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold, I wouldn't hold your, you, you might, you might be able to hold your breath for that one. Um, I can tell you that the API is available because I know other apps that are able, I don't think they're publicly available yet, but there are other apps that are absolutely taking camera feeds into them and streaming them out. Um, so there, those are, so the API is available to, to, um, developers. It's not just held by the, uh, FaceTime. So you'll see other things happening. So that would be a possibility. Um, they're already working, but not on the iPhone yet. Uh, but on the iPad, uh, those apps are already in, uh, they're in development and they're already actively working. Cool. Next question. Oh, sorry. That's me. <laughs> uh, next question. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm still, I'm still, I get used to that. Uh, next question is from Rayon Smith in Trinidad, West Indies. And Rayon asks, uh, remote control has come for the Yolo box, Aaron Parecki. And he's got a link there to a YouTube video. Jeffrey Powers, have you uh, watched and do you know what's uh, going on here? Yeah, no, I, I know. Uh, yeah, uh, Yolo Box uh, has been uh, uh, basically trying. This is a widely requested uh, uh, thing for Yolo Box. Here's the here's the deal. You first of all, you need the Yolo Box Ultra. It doesn't work on any of the other Yolo boxes as of yet. Maybe down the road that could change. You'd have to also connect up to their Yolo Cast network, um, and of course they have an app for Android. They don't have an app for iOS, but if you connect up to the web uh, through a web page, you'll be able to access the uh, the Yolo Cast uh, software. So, and that's a little concerning. Why it's not connected? They don't have an iOS version. That means that they have some security hurdles that they need to get through. So. Uh, that ultimately what will the YoloCast software will do is it'll do a handshake with the IP, your local IP uh, f- where the Yolo box is, and then uh, it will use that, basically turn it into a cloud uh, system there so you can send it out to wherever you need to. Uh, and of course, YoloCast, it's, think of it like the uh, StreamYard or a Restream, uh, except you can connect up a physical piece of hardware to it. Guy Cochran. Yeah, I watched some of the videos, uh, the Aaron Parecki video, and I, I wanted to get excited about this. I was like, yeah, finally. And then I scrubbed through it and I was looking for all the functionality. And I'm like, what a joke. Like, this is this is garbage. It's just, uh, compare it to the Mageful Director Mini for about the same price, and you have full control over the Director Mini, and you get SRT. It's way... I'll put a link in the chat to the Director Mini manual, and you guys can look through all the control that you have. It, it, it's bananas how much more... And it's... It's a broadcast quality uh, UI where, Jeff, you want to tell them about uh, your experience with Majorl's uh, control hub and uh, the finite control that you can see of, of uh, the devices? Pop in, Jeff. Uh, it is, it's huge. Uh, most, of our, most of our devices, I, all of our Majorl devices, but most of our devices, I don't buy anything if I can't actually access it from 
uh, whether it be on a local land, but that's rare now. It's mostly about uh, using more centralized control. Um, so even our live views, you know, we can dive in live view central, control it remotely. Uh, the the Magewell bringing in, it used to be called Magewell Cloud, and they renamed it to Magewell Control. It runs, ours runs in the cloud, but it's it's basically a computer could run it also if you had one dedicated to it on local LAN, and that could be exposed to the cloud through just one port. But when they come online, there you can see it's online, but then you just click and you access it, and you have all the access to it as if you were on the local LAN. It is a beautiful thing to be able to manage and and see. I mean, I've got 50 machines that are 50 devices on it, and you can see where state is on everything and address it, make sure you can turn it on and off, tweak it to your heart's content. And that is just smooth. And, and everybody else seems to be chasing that same goal. Um, I know the bird dog guys are, have something similar to it, but it's still nowhere near as defined as the as the Magewell side. To go back, once you have that and you use it, once you go back to just, oh, I can only access this through a browser or a local LAN, it's like you're working in, you know, baseband or something. Jeffrey Powers wanted to come back in. Yeah, uh, one more thing about uh, YOLO Live and YOLO Cast is you got to also remember it is also a Chinese uh, based company. So you definitely want to read through the terms of service if you're going to be using YOLO, uh, YOLO Live in any capacity. Uh, like, for instance, the InStream, they don't, uh, they don't use Google Play for their InStream, uh, they use a third party uh, uh, app distributor which means ads on the app which means uh, and of course that company is also based in china so you you definitely want to be very uh cautious when it comes to purchasing anything or using anything that's based in uh in china right now let's go to the next question next question is from sam rhymes in maidenhead uk and sam asks I want to light myself for my YouTube videos, but I can't move big lights around due to my physical disability. Any recommendations for small lights that I can attach to my desk? All right. Alex is going to start you off here. Alex? You know, the ones that I use a lot when I travel are the Pavo Tube 6 uh, Cs. Um, those are they're relatively small. They're light. They have magnets, so you can just snap them to things. They've got quarter 20s. You can put make them lots of different colors, and I'll put four of them together. I can have some of them as a backup, some of them as keys. Um, and they work really well. That's made by Nanlite. Um, but the Pavo tubes have worked really well for me um, as far as small and easy to move around. I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of different lighting options. Um, but those are the ones that I use when I when I need it to be small and easy. Um, Aperture obviously makes um, a, a lot of good ones as well. Nanlite makes a lot of smaller ones, the Luma pads. So there's the so Aperture and Nanlite are probably two pretty solid sources to look at for a relatively cost effective and small lights. And those Pavo tubes, by the way, get up to about eight feet long. <laughs> the ones I have are about a foot long, but you can get lots of different lengths um, to make that actually work. They're actually battery battery powered as well, so you can kind of get them where you need them and then wire them up later, um, which is kind of kind of useful. The other thing I would say is um, you're just out of London. There's a lot of members in London. You know, think about putting up larger lights, getting some help. Um, you know, you might be able to find people in our community willing to help you for a day and then just make sure that the, that the lights um, are are set up in a place that they can stay forever. My lights don't move at all. Like I, I turn them on and I turn them on with my with my watch. <laughs> you know, so, so uh, you know, like you don't like once they're up. So it's it's a matter of finding some friends that will help you design something um, that will that you don't have to take down and put up. And, you know, and this is part of what's great about being part of a bigger community is that you might be able to find folks that can help you do that once you've designed what you want. But just make sure that you can control them, whether it's your iPhone or DMX or something else that you can turn them on and off and make all those adjustments without having to get to them. Nigel. I think Alex picked up on the point I was going to say. I use the Elgato lights. They're quite light. Uh, they take a little bit of, you know, screwing to a desk or something. But once that's done, uh, you can use your stream deck. And so making sure you make it easy for yourself every day to turn them on and turn them off really is, is I think, is is very helpful. And again, if you don't need to move them, then a friend, as Alex said, uh, can come all the way to Maidenhead if they'll leave London, which people don't know. It's a long way. <laughs> Guy Cochran. Yeah, I really like the Aperture Lights with the Citus Link app. Uh, it's one where you can control any of any of your lights uh, with, in multiples and group them. And tomorrow we're actually going to go to a studio uh, here in Seattle that has a ton of Aperture Lights. Uh, 
I mean, you, we'll change colors on those and we'll look at the Citus Link app and walk around that studio and you'll see how much control that they have. I mean, sure, you could do it with, with DMX and uh, a lighting board and all that, but for for cheap, uh, the Aperture stuff, I mean, you just buy one for 60, 70 bucks and you're, you're in the game. Or you can buy the little bulbs, the B7 bulbs that screw into a, a, a practical outlet, just a regular Edison uh, circuit. Uh, so the, those are a place to get started. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's somebody locally that would uh, help you out and get them set up. But once they're set up, yeah, the Citus Link app is the way to roll. And uh, Sam, there was a lot of chat uh, on the on the Lincoln Mukana about this today, and we got some good suggestions, including uh, Mickey Makachor said Westcott flex lights. I've had, seen some people who really love those; they're incredibly light. They're a little kind of flexible panel that puts out a good little bit of light. Elgato's key lights were mentioned. Aperture small LED LEDs from Eduardo Augustine. So uh, there are some more suggestions in there for options. But good luck with getting your rig set up. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from uh, Matthew LeCount in uh, Oakland, and. Uh, uh, Matthew uh, asks, been addressed a million times, but uh, what in-ear monitors are recommended for comms? Okay, we got a lot of players on this one too. Jeff Keithley's going to start us off. Jeff? Currently right now in my ear is the AS10. I believe it's one from uh, Amazon Specials, probably 30, 40 bucks, something like that. I was just looking for something to have that I could not worry about being really costly because it got tired of buying really costly and losing them or or they just didn't last near as long um and i've been really happy with them they sound pretty good and, and actually sound really good and they're multi-driver and everything and as you can tell it kind of disappears uh for the most part especially if you got the size face that i have to hide it so uh that's one thing but the other is uh i fell in love with actually over the uh, last few months is these open comms and they're bone conducting so it allows me to hear my outside world a lot and uh one of the key things on it it does have a boom uh so with the boom it allows you to get a little closer to your mouth and uh even in a really quiet environments it's they've been really good for us and, and now i use com when i'm saying comms i'm not sure if you talk about like this kind of comms or true comms uh for true comms if I'm using VCOM or Unity, I'm using these most likely, or my uh, old faithful, my trucker headset, as I call it. Uh, this is a yeah, Blue Parrot, and I don't remember the model on it. There's there's the newer models that have USB-C for charging and stuff. They've been great. They last forever. They will last a whole day, day and a half even. Uh, the open comps are pretty good on the battery too, surprisingly, as small as they are. Uh, but I, for regular comms in a truck, RTS headsets, hands down, the little small guys, I can't remember the model number, but the hands down, those are the most comfortable to, to be able to lis listen and talk on for, you know, hours, days at a time. Nigel. Yeah. Uh, good advice. The, if you want something that looks a little more subtle or looks a little more fancy, the Bumbies, or I use the any ears which uh, I have in at the moment, in that ear over there, you can't see it. Um, those work really well. They, they have a, a 3.5 mil um, jack, goes into anything that will take it, and, and they're very comfortable. And I, I have a setup with a, an Angry Audio um, breakaway, and I just leave them in all day. Alex? Yeah, it really depends on what you're trying to do. You know, for in-ear, uh, you know, like for what I use on a day-to-day -day basis, these are the Linsole uh, SZ10s Pros or whatever that are about 50 bucks. And that's what I use for my my daily uh, run for comms when I'm on shows. I typically, if I'm using Unity, I'm typically using the open comms like Jeff. Um, I have two of them. <laughs> I just switch and I actually labeled them on the inside. I have a little sticker on them. It's one and two. Um, so that I know which one I have, which ones I'm, I'm attaching. Um, I'm pretty careful. The big thing is to attach them to only one device. So I only attach them to one device so they never get confused. They will jump between them otherwise. And so um, so I attach them to a single, a single device to make sure that they're going to work. Um, and they are very reliable. The reason, one of the reasons is, is that they, they're, I've sat with someone on the other side and said, listen to me. And I start using different in-ears to, or different uh, headsets and they were like, that's the one that sounds the best. <laughs> so, so I, you know, so I'm, I want not only that I hear well, um, but I want to make sure that other people hear well. And the other big advantage with a bone conduction is that I have my program in my ears. So I can have program in my ears and be listening to comms at the same time. Um, and that, that's super useful for me. Uh, when it comes to doing actual headset headsets, I lean towards double muff, clear comm, 
headsets, you know, when I'm using, you know, when I'm looking at a, at a true headset, if I'm, if I'm really going to put something on my head like that, I want to just block everything else out. You know, so, and there's a, that's a whole religious discussion. I know we don't talk about religion here about small light versus heavy, uh, one ear versus two ears. So I'm the big over the ear, two ear headset down, you know, like clear comm headset if I'm, if I'm doing that, cause I want to stay focused on what I'm doing. And a lot of times I'll take my, my in ears and I'll run them up under it and stick them in. Um, to make that actually work. So there's a couple different ways that you can make that happen. Jeffrey Powers. Yeah, I'm the same way on that, especially noise cancellation. Uh, then you can try and get out of all the other stuff with uh, inners. For the show, I just basically use uh, some generic, I think it's called FIIL, because I don't need to talk to, I, I'm only listening on comms. I'm not, I'm not talking on comms. The open comm uh, as well, the microphone on anything is the most important thing if you have to talk to somebody, because if it sounds too airy, if it sounds too distant, they won't be able to hear you. Uh, uh, you need to have a good, nice, tight sound to it. And with the open comms, you can get the UC2. If you can plug this in, they have a, a, a dongle that comes with it that's dedicated for the headset. So if Bluetooth doesn't work, you can plug this into the computer and then go direct there. So uh, if you have, if you can connect to the computer that way. Uh, so that's that's another option right there. Uh, so, But it really depends on the situation that you're using your comms. Guy Cochran. Yeah, I'm also using the open comms uh, shocks uh, that Alex and Jeff have with uh, with Unity. But I'm curious as to Jeff, when you're in your shows uh, and you're in the truck, are you, do you have those little um, Roland or little Dante speakers and you're listening to the show through speakers and then comms is on a headset? Is that the way that you're rolling or, or how do you get program? It really depends on most of our applications. Um, when we were doing tennis as heavily as we were, we're not doing that anymore. We had two or three, sometimes as many as eight different courts going on. So we needed to isolate the audio. So program audio, we need to be able to hear and isolate that. So we use a Dante backbone on all of our audio that was fed into Dante studio technology boxes for the comm side. And then we could actually choose which channels were going to that through our radius system uh, for that purpose was better headsets. So I invested in the same broadcast headsets that we have our broadcasters on, our commentators on. So that's the uh, 300s, I believe, the Sennheiser 300s and some some of the higher end uh, 26s and 27s. But those really sound good. And they in the 300s especially were super isolating. So for me, it, it just depends. I, I wouldn't use these to check audio. I wouldn't use the open comms. It's just strictly comms. And like when I'm moving around, but I'm in the truck, I usually put on the better headsets. I, I do find those RTSs are really acceptable though, because they're small, they sit on your ear and it just, after 10 or 12 hours on, on air, it's uh, the big headsets get a little uncomfortable. So I'm in the same camp with Nigel. I have N ears. And the reason that I like them for the show here is that they're comms headsets, really. They're used a lot by police and fire. They're pretty indestructible. They're not inexpensive. They're 130, 150 bucks, something like that. But the thing I love most about them is that they're so small in your ear that if you have to monitor audio, you can sit on a set of headphones. And when I'm narrating and I have a client that's working with me uh, remotely, I can hear everything I need to in the program through the regular headphones. And then just that little bug in my ear is the connection back and forth to the client. So they can talk to me even if I'm in the middle of open mic land. And that works for me. Everybody's use case is going to be a little different. Alex, do you have a final thought before we move on? Yeah. And one thing is, is whether you're in front of a client or not. So a lot of times if I'm in front of clients, I switch over to Ear Heroes or the Bubble Bees. Um, and it gets people's attention. <laughs> like it actually like people will notice that you suddenly are going, you know, you suddenly they realize you have something in your ear. Um, and I've actually gotten work from that, like that, 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 that I have something that is nicer than what they're used to seeing someone have. And um, so you just have to know that there is some theater to the process. You know, the reason I got into Ear Heroes was I walked up to Secret Service and so, hey, can I ask you a question? And he put his hand under his jacket and he said, yeah, what do you want? And I, and I was like, no, no, I just want to know what's in your ear. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's our ear heroes. They're great. And and and, and um, anyway, uh, so that's how I got into it. But, you know, when you see that, uh, it, it does get you noticed, um, you know, it, it, because it's not very noticeable. Um, and you have to kind of keep, um, you, you want to keep track of those things. Like, you know, that the things matter of how things look, um, you know, in, when you're in a client facing position. Jeff Geekley and another last not note. I would disagree with Alex on this. 
it seems like no matter what, no matter what you have on your head, somebody's always going to come back and start talking to you. And <laughs> there's nothing worse, absolutely nothing worse than sitting there in a corporate event or special. That happens more in corporate than we're locked away in our truck. But it, it's like you're walking up, you see I have headphones on, and I'm like, I can't hear you. And they'll still just talk, 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 and ask you a question, you know. And the worst to me is whenever we were doing the layers. So we had the in ears on, and we were monitoring audio. Then we had another headset on top of that. And you're having to, and these especially, these really do isolate really well. So they're talking to me. I can't hear a word they're saying. I've got sound canceling on my head and everything. And then you have to dismount it all. And then you're like. Yeah, see, oh, you see, just wanted to know where the restroom was? You, you, really? You, you and I, you and I approach this very differently because I have a team that work that has to do all of that when I'm at an, at an event, and I sit nearest to the to the walkway so that people will ask me questions because that's how I build business. <laughs> so, 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 like you know, so me being available and having people do it, and I built a lot of business right, that all right, way. All right, I'll take I'll take that as a win. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, maybe I just don't like talking to people. I, I maybe told, that's I told I Elemental, I, I told Elemental, like they took off the green, they were, they were like, what do you think of those, those green front ends for the appliance? And I'm like, oh, get, you know, I'm, I have generated over $2 million of, of revenue just from those green front ends. Do not take those away. And, um, and they put, they made them orange, which I hate, but anyway, but the, but the, um, I still have the green ones. Um, and, uh, uh, they, but, but they didn't understand. And I said, because people ask me what those are, there's a whole rack and there's these, these green LEDs and they're like, what's that? And I said, oh, those are encoders. I call that one Tesla one and Tesla two. Cause I could have ordered, I could have owned two Teslas. And then, then they go, oh, they're, they're spending money on hardware. And next thing I know I have more work. So. Guy Cochran wants a, a thought on this guy. Yeah, I had to circle back to the the oh, bigger there you headset. Go. Serious comms headsets. Yeah. So this is the Sennheiser HMD 26-2. Now, the cool thing about these is they have this flip up. So you, you see this? So while it's on your head, if you want to listen to the outside world, you just flip this up and it has these, see the top? They spread apart so it fits your head nice. And then that's a boom mic and it's terminated in uh, XLR for the mic and then a uh, quarter inch for for the comms uh, to plug in the, the actual headphones. Uh, Tomorrow, when we're at that studio, if you want to see what $125,000 worth of Rito Bellero looks like and the headsets that they have, because when I was on set with them, they uh, they said, hey, do you want dual muff or do you want single muff? And I was like, Boleros? <laughs> like, these are the awesome comms. So tomorrow, yeah, you know, somebody make it a question to ask about the Rito Boleros. You know, when you see an RTS, you go, oh, you, you come from trucks. And when you see Clearcom, you go, oh, you come from events. And, and when you see Riedel, you say, oh, you come from money. <laughs> see, Matthew, you thought this was going to be a simple question. What's your favorite in-ear monitor? <laughs> we just had a, about 10 minutes of fascinating conversation. Everybody uses what they need for their particular type of work. Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> next question is from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul asks, what's the key to pulling together a crack audio video production team of five to six folks for a NASA project uh, in Austin. Uh, Alex Lindsay, that's going to be a simple thing, right? <laughs> it, it depends. It depends. <laughs> like you have to figure like the best part of having freelance teams is that you get the job and then you say, I need a person that knows this. I need a person that knows that. I don't define the team before I have the job or I know what the job is. I want to know what the job is. And then I piece together the perfect team that's available for that team. So you'd have to tell us, you'd have to tell me at least. I wouldn't, I, I just don't have any cookie cutter solutions. Um, I, I wanna know what the project is and then I'm gonna find the right people for that project. Yeah, when is it, who's available? Uh, Jeff Geekley, how do you approach this? I believe and I agree completely with what Alex said on that. So uh, right team, right tool for the right job. There you go. These are bespoke things. There's not a not a simple. But answer. you have to start with hiring people from Texas first because we're here. So <laughs> yeah, that was like right. You know, whatever it is, you should be flexible. But hot, call me. <laughs> yeah. Everything can be bigger tomorrow. in Texas, so just not your rate, time. please. Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> next question is from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia, and Tony asks, "I don't have speakers in my setup. Should I get home pods or something else?" Ooh, Nigel, what do you think? I guess it depends what you want to listen to and want to do with them. If if it's a question of I just uh, want to hear it a bit better, 
Um, you can buy very cheap USB speakers, even a little soundbar from Amazon for 20 bucks. Uh, you can go to the other end uh, and buy very expensive speakers, but you need something to drive them. Um, so you may need a, an amp or something to drive them. Um, the HomePods feels to me uh, you'd probably need two, a right and a left, a little bit like an overkill, depending, unless you really want to hear uh, good, as they say. But if you really want to hear good, then you really need speakers and uh, headphones. So I, I think unless there's some specific reason or you're reusing existing or HomePods, maybe I'm missing something. I think you can get 20 bucks, good, 50 bucks, a good set of uh, USB speakers from Amazon. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Jeffrey Powers. Sorry. Yeah, I totally, that's okay. I totally agree on that because, uh, uh, well, I do video editing and I do some audio editing, very little audio editing, more than uh, than the video. But uh, I always like to put it in the headphones and listen to it, put it on the desktop speakers and listen to it. And if I'm doing any type of music creation, the latency on a lot of speakers is always going to be a problem. Now, the HomePods, uh, there's I, last time I checked, there is no direct connect into the home pods. I didn't, never had the big base station, uh, but uh, I've I I am I would not use it. I'm not a big fan of the home pods. They've always had problems from the little the little speakers that I had connection wise. As we ta as Alex talked about a couple questions ago, if you have multiple devices attached to it, you could be listening to something on your uh, on your desktop, and all of a sudden your phone starts to ring, and then all of a sudden everything just kind of quiets down. So if you need it for that, you'll have to dedicate it for the desktop. But uh, something direct connected will have the least amount of latency, uh, and especially if you're editing, that that makes all the difference. Alex Lindsay. Yeah, I'll show you what I have. I don't know if these are the right ones for you. I do have some HomePods, but I don't use them in production. I don't really have them here. I actually don't want them to hear anything because I have other things that will react to me saying the the S word. Um, and so, so I, um, uh, so the ones that I have that I tend to have laying around um, that I'm working with, a lot of them are two two JBLs and a Roland. Um, so this is the JBL 305s. I have a bunch of these. I use them for just reviewing some surround stuff so I can put things around it. They're not great. The 700 series is a lot better, but it's also a lot more expensive. It's uh, like almost 10 times as expensive, but the 300s I use as just a little, like I can walk over to them and see if things are working correctly. Um, so that's one that I have there. Um, I've got a bunch of those. Um, the one that you see in production a lot are these C1 Pros. Um, so these are, these are, and all of these are powered speakers. Um, when I'm getting a speaker, I want it to be self-powered because I just want to be able to run XLR to it. I don't want to try to figure out how to power it. I don't want to think about amps. I want them all to have their own power. Um, so you see these a lot. I've got a couple of them. Um, and uh, you these are really, really popular as um, production uh, speakers. Um, that that you have there, and so they're and they're less expensive than the HomePods, um, but they are that XLR in and they're self powered. I think they're just uh, figure eights on the back end, um, and then the last one that the one that sits on my desk um, regularly is this one of all things, and I bought it. You can see that I bought it from Amazon twelve years ago. <laughs> it's still sitting on my desk, and one of the uh, one of the it's sitting right here, um, and uh, uh, the one of the reasons for it is is I've got a lot of inputs here, so I've got. You know, if you if you look at it here, I've got a bunch of different channel inputs. Um, it's it's powered. Um, I can you know, and so I've got XLR, and then I've got some uh, TRSs and everything else. And I have control over all of those. If you look at them, I have a lot of control over the ones in the front, so I can route a bunch of things to it and uh, be able to have it as a desktop. It's not small, but it's also not huge. And again, it's just the one that has survived for 12 years of wandering around and me needing to have something there and being able to put a bunch of inputs into it and, and have something that I can review easily. Nigel, you had a re return. Yeah, I just wanted to go back a step. We don't, I don't know how you want to connect to these speakers, whether you're using Bluetooth from your studio, whether you have a mix that can get XLR out, you want to use USB or you're going to use the speaker connection from a, a, a MacBook or something. That really is the place you have to start because like Alex, I have a I have the KRKs that are similar to that. By the way, the difference between the five inch and the seven inch in all of these things is dramatic in price and effect, but you may not need it that loud anyway. But again, then you need something to drive XLR. My only net ad is, um, if you go the route of those speakers or the KRKs or something, buy some little stands for them. So they can be at the height, if you can't put them on your desk, because you don't necessarily want them on your desk, they can be at the height of your ears so that, that you can listen to it uh, directly. Alex? 
And this one is actually fed with Dante. <laughs> so, so I have, so I can route anything out to it um, relatively easily so that I have, I just have Avio, an Avio stuck into it. And so then I can just, I can see anything, just send it to the speaker. And, and so that's a, and you can do the same thing if you have a Bluetooth, you know, you can have your phone just kind of attached to it and then send it to the speaker as well. So you can send any, you know, by having a, a Dante connection um, in there, uh, you know, having an Avio into a production speaker like this with a, that's self-powered, uh, you can now, with a Bluetooth version of that as well, you can kind of route kind of every, you can kind of figure out how to route everything to it. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Chris Widener in um, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And Chris asks, three by three video wall, what's the suggested hardware? Um, Bird dog uh, or data path seemed good, but screens are HDMI or DVI. Jeff Keithley is going to start us off here. Jeff. It really depends on the application. If you're needing to use it as, as like a large wall for iMag purposes to put live content on it, then you want your latency to be low as possible. Use a hardware solution, hands down. Um, I'm not a fan of what the bird dog plays can do in that video wall type setup. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I just not had a good feeling with them. So I would lean more towards the Magewell as a decoder instead. Uh, it's a little bit more money, but a lot of more flexibility. The main thing is a processor because you're going to have to do a process to it. Um, so it really depends what the use case is. And sorry, but a three by three video wall could just be for ads. It could be just for content to play back on it. You know, that's not really pertinent to a presentation or something. But if it's in a presentation situation, hardware hands down, that is where you want the reliability and the flexibility. Well, let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Samuel Norvik in Norway. And Samuel asks, what are the advantages of using Nimble Streamer and how do you use it in your cloud workflow? Going right back to Jeff Keithley, Jeff. Nimble. I love my Nimbles. Uh, they're very nimble. And, and the main reason uh, that we use them is for, for transcoding purposes. So we go in SRT, we come out NDI. It's another type of instance that we use just for flipping signals around. Um, cost wise it's actually really good uh, it's nowhere near as expensive as uh, building out a sienna processing engine which we also use for doing the same functionality uh one thing specifically with one of our clients is we built out multiple systems with them so they could use different shows and have different shows built to that nimble instance so they're using tags and aws to help manage that billing and such and so uh the flexibility of it is in the cost is just really low uh, but the flexibility of it is really impressive and uh, it, you can just grow it. And then if you need more, it's not that much just to add a second, a third, a fourth, a tenth, whatever you need. And we are sitting here on Thursday, which means that don't forget after the show, normally two things happen. The Isadora Lab with L. Wilson Spiro. So if you're interested in Isadora as a tool, you can learn about that right after the show. Also, an hour after that, that happens at 10. Uh, there's typically a Mimo Live Lab with Oliver Bryden back. So keep those on your calendar if you're interested in those technologies. They're very important. We have a couple of big events coming up here at Office Hours that we're very excited about. So if you've been listening to the show or watching the show for a while, while, you know that a week from Monday, we are going to be in, starting in Texas, we're going to be all over the web because it is the eclipse, the solar full solar eclipse. And we're very excited about that. We've got a team that'll be covering it from about 11 o'clock in the morning for an hour and a half. That's about the time it's going to take uh, to trans over the entire country. We will start talking about it at 11 a.m. It'll probably be down in Mexico. It's coming on shore, I think, at near Mazatlan. And then it crosses across Texas. We'll have some folks in Texas talking about what they're seeing. And we're going to try to live stream this uh, as well as we possibly can. We've got some guests coming in to talk about the astrophysics of the whole thing and how this all functions. And we're going to follow it in, in hops across the country as it goes through totality as it makes its way across the entire United States. So it should be an exciting day. We're very much looking forward to it. So if you want to experience that and learn a little bit about it, uh, that's your day. Come and join 
us on Monday, a week from this coming Monday, as we watch the solar eclipse here on Office Hours and live stream the whole thing for you. And then after the eclipse takes place, one week after that, we are heading to NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters show in Las Vegas. We have some extraordinary coverage planned for you. Everybody is really excited about this trip. Uh, you know, we've been covering these kind of events for a while now, and we've gone to various ones. And I think we're just getting better and better at it. And so hopefully we'll have the same thing here. We've got um, live view coverage, so we'll be coming live from the, sh the show floor at NAB. Uh, we'll have teams of people in the back end. We'll have teams of people on air, and we'll be live there bringing you things with our Mukana interface, which means that you will be able to in at least as much as we can make it all work in the cacophony of NAB, we will be taking your questions and trying to get them as much as we can onto the show floor. So it should be exciting coverage one way or another. So please join us for NAB. Uh, that starts, I think, two weeks from this coming uh, Sunday. So Sunday's the first day of that. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are heading into the second hour of Q&A on our show for today. So thank you all for being here. Let's dive right into our next question. Next question is from Clive Ludford in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, and Clyde, uh, Clive sorry, asks, um, uh, Alex speaks about redundancy all the time. Uh, would this H.265 encoder be acceptable for a hardware encoder over software like OBS until a freelancer can get a web presenter? And Jeff Keithley is going to start us off. Jeff? For my applications, no. We've tried it, and I, I didn't try it myself. It was, it was a freelancer that we were working with. He goes, oh, I just bought this off of Amazon. It should do SRT. And it was a nightmare. It just kept cutting in and out. You, you get what you pay for a lot of times, unfortunately. Um, the Ultra Encoder by Magewell, I feel like a Magewell shield or something, but I, I literally... The, the stuff just works. And that's what I like about it. Uh, the Ultra Encoder by Mesh Wells for five or $600. It does everything we need it to do. And we can send out uh, multiple RTMPs, multiple streams of S SRT through it. It's just a really flexible uh, device. I would absolutely go that route versus I wouldn't even go to the web presenter. It's just, it's not worth it. Just go to the Mesh Well and be done with it. Guy Cochran. Yeah, pretty much the same. When when you get some of these inexpensive models, the the interfaces they're just not super elegant. And this this is one of the the inexpensive uh, Chinese models where if you see something like an Osprey Talon and you see how granular you can go in and you can change the bit rate. So like this one, you can't even change the bit rate. So like, am I sending two thousand uh, mega uh, two thousand kilobits or am I sending five thousand? What if I want to send ten thousand? Is it H.264? Is it H.265? Is it 422? So some of these won't accept, like vMix um, won't take 10 bit 422. It, it just, H.265, it just won't take it. So you need something like an SRT gateway or something to stick in front of it. So having that control of with a real device or software, OBS might even be better because there are SRT controls uh, that are granular. As long as you have a, a uh, powerful computer, then I would I'd probably just stick with OBS instead of getting one of those hardware encoders because I have like four of them right right now. I have a Kilo View, which Kilo View is nice. It it's okay, but it's just a step above this this inexpensive one. But like Jeff said, the um, the the bigger boys, the Magewells, the Epifan. We like the Epifan Pearl Nanos. Those work really well. You could rent those. But just to get started and push out a feed, OBS it's free as long as your computer will push it. Give it a, give it a roll and then use. Uh, Wirecast will take in an SRT feed now, and so will VMix. VMix is 60 bucks a month, um, or, and you got a free 60-day trial if you just want to send something to another place. Jeffrey Powers. I'll add one more to what Guy said. Is it is it native to PAL? Is it native to NTSC? Because I've uh, I've bought some of these things, and all of a sudden they say, "Oh yeah, well, it works on NTSC," but you you do a deep dive, and and it's really trying to do a PAL signal, and then you end up having to take a decimator and put it in there for the HDMI signal. So it it ends up not being worth the hundred eighteen dollars uh, for our devices like that. Alex. 100% agree with Guy that I would use OBS before I use this piece of hardware. You know, like it's just uh, that, you know, you're, uh, this is not going to be reliable. You're, a good laptop with OBS will do better than this. It, I don't do that very often, <laughs> like, you know, uh, uh, but, I, but I would do that over what you're looking at there. 
Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. And Paul asks, I just got a 30 by 40 by 20 high shop and I want to build a streaming studio in half of it with a loft above. Any suggestions? Ooh, I think we'll have some for you. Alex, start us off. I mean, the big thing I would think about is you're going to lose a foot between the two. Um, and so I'd be pretty stingy about that loft. So I probably would make the loft probably seven feet. Um, so, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd protect 12 feet on the in the uh, studio. So you really 12 feet is the right number um, to have a studio height um, there. Uh, as you go below that, you start because you're going to want to drop a grid. If you're really thinking about I want to build a studio then you're going to want a grid, you know, so you're going to want a grid, a speed rail that's, that's laying down below that. And that's going to, that's going to cost you another foot. Um, then you're going to have lights that are going to cost you another couple of feet. And so before you know it, you've got lights hanging at nine or 10 feet and you can't, you know, that's, that's what you need to do a wide shot of someone standing. You're going to need those lights at a certain height. And so when you start thinking about those logistics, that's why you kind of want to get to 12 feet as you can, as, as fast as you can. If it's empty, the other thing you want to think about What's around you? Do you need to float it? So if you're going to need to float it, you're going to also lose lose space there. So um, floating means you're going to build a, an air gap between the outer wall and the inner wall. It's a technical thing to do. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to build some stuff in between. That You have to really um, bring somebody in that knows how to do that or really study it um, to, to make that happen. But if you float it, then it's now going to be nice and quiet inside. The larger that float um, space, uh, the, the lower the frequencies are that you're going to um, be able to defeat. And so you just have to think about what's around you and also just think about whether it's viable to build a studio. Like, do you have a lot of, like if you have a, you know, you don't, I'm sure you don't have this in Austin or maybe you don't have it in Austin, but in San Francisco, we used to pay a lot of attention to where the subway went because that was not possible. Like if you're, if you're on the first floor or below the first floor and there's a subway within a block of you, you're not going to be able to get rid of that noise. Um, so, so the, um, so those are the kind of things to think about there. Um, think about how much power you have. You're going to want, you know, like as you start to really build a studio, uh, you should be thinking about, you know, 100 to 200 amps available to you um, minimum. That's like, that's, that's the, um, that's table stakes um, for what you're looking at there. Um, so think about how much power, where the power is, how much you're going to be able to back it up. So those are the, the kind of things that you want to start thinking about. Are you in a place where you're going to be able to get good internet? And most importantly, are you going to place that you can get two, ver you know, two different internet providers of one gig or more? Um, up and down. Those are the kind of things you want to do. If you're going to start investing into a studio, you just have to know that it's going to be able to do the things that you want it to do. Um, you know, if you build if you build it and they uh, and there's one of these little things that are a little off, it just gets to be a lot more work for you to get things done. Guy Cochran. Yeah, tomorrow we get the luxury of getting to go to a studio that uh, I shot in a long time ago before these guys uh, picked it up. So it was one of the the quietest studios. It is known as the quietest studio in Seattle. So sometimes you got to think about what am I shooting and does it matter if it's uh, soundproofed, uh, not floated, not uh, if an airplane flies over, is it live? Is it a take that you can redo? Because some of that stuff matters. If you got 20 people waiting on sound, you know, it's, it's, it, it can cause serious uh, production delays and cost money. So uh, what are you going to do with the studio? And then power, AC. So tomorrow, one of the things that I noticed in, when they built this one out is that you can view from one of the rooms through a little glass window into the set. So as talent standing by, uh, they get a lot of CEOs from these big companies locally uh, that are standing by. It's kind of like a green room, but it's also a, a second studio edit suite. But they can see what's going on in there and, and cruise in. So be, be sure to tune in tomorrow because I'm going to drive all the way down there at the wee hours of the morning uh, and for you guys around so it, it this is a, a seven figure studio so it's it's worth tuning into and, and the way that they built it out well andy carluccio is going to laugh at the 12 zoom laptop drones when he sees this farm of like hey it's 2024 you shouldn't be using uh screen scraping uh so <laughs> but they, they did model it af after nasa they did some work with nasa so they it looks it's the same paint color the same desk configurations they've got these crazy led oled monitor walls so you when you walk in the the monitor wall just it it's so saturated and crisp but so things like that uh one of the things that uh in jeff keepley's uh uh uh, what do you call it? Show that uh, he's. We talked about this truck. It's called uh, NEP and ND1. And uh, Greg Balot was in. And when I looked at the diagrams, because Jonas said, "Hey, look at the diagrams of uh, NEP ND1," and they're all on the website. So if you're building out a studio, look at what's in a truck and look at what you may need. So they've got like three different. Uh, 
configurations, audio, uh, playback. So what are some of these things that you're not thinking of that you may need? They have their monitor configurations for the wall. So they, they show you what's on the wall. So there's, I'll put a link in the chat to s some of the ideas that you can get by looking at these trucks because these guys are doing it at the highest level. So some of this stuff you might want to ask yourself, do, do I need it? Or can I just put it in a mobile rig and roll it in? Uh, to, what, what am I truly doing with my studio? So lots of questions. Jeff Keithley. And there's so much to unpack whenever we start talking about studio spaces and all. First off, I, I, what everybody else said is is great, but think about the first thing that you need is good power. Uh, that That is actually really important. Make sure you have adequate service coming in. It needs to be, technically, you could get by with a single-phase service, but if you could get three-phase services, even better because that's gonna allow you to use a much larger robot arm, but you're definitely gonna need that as your second choice. So you wanna to go to Mark Roberts Motion Control, and I'll be glad to introduce you to all the right guys there. And you need one of those 150 to 200,000, not the really expensive, but you wanna get a robot arm in there because everything else doesn't matter if you have a robot arm. Uh, three, just, just to let three you know. Three robot arms, three robot well, arms. I mean, if you have, if you have the space, with me. you could do more. But yeah, Fine. two at minimum, two at minimum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, but that's where you wanna start, Paul. Don't, don't worry about all that sound deadening and stuff like that. Robot arms, that's where it's all at. Robot arms for key fill and backlight. Nigel, take us away. To the next I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if anyone's mentioned this. We're talking Texas. Can I suggest we think through the air conditioning? Um, yes, it gets please. a little warm in this part of Texas. <laughs> Actually, like I hunt. think he's in Arkansas with this. I, if I remember reading something. Uh, I think Arkansas gets hot like yeah. Texas as well, Jeff. But it, we had like 100 days last year of our, like 100 degrees nearly. So really think through your air conditioning so it's comfortable and it's quiet and it makes sense. I'm going to double down on that. Having had my studio in Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's 115 in the summertime, I spent a lot of money on a very powerful mini split system. Actually, it was kind of more a media split. Uh, and I, that was the best money I ever spent. To be able to keep air conditioning on during live mic recording was worth its weight in platinum to me. So, uh, Alex, you want to come back in on this? I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. so, man, we I looked at it, I was like, I was like, there was something else that I thought was important to say there. And I think I got caught, I caught up thinking about uh, motion control arms. You know, okay. one more thing I wanted I, to mention. Alex is like, squirrel. Yeah. I was like, one of the, one arms, more thing I wanted to mention arms. is I, uh, before, um, for the original point about ceiling heights, it's great to have a high ceiling, fabulous, but I needed a lot of stuff down on desktop. So I put in a series like this of pantographs that my lighting and sound and everything else could be mounted on, which meant that if I had something where I was shooting head to toe on somebody, I wanted all my lights and all my mics and everything up. But if I were doing a tabletop setup in the studio, I wanted to bring everything down so that everybody wasn't lit from way up high. But so that's just one thing you can do. What I was going to say is that Paul should... Uh, get a bunch of, um, he should shoot some, go with polycam and build a 3D model, uh, take a bunch of photos and we should make a second hour out of this. Let's design oh, Paul's studio. Like let's, let's do it, like put it up maybe a week ahead of time. We'll put it up in after hours or, or in office hours or in the discord. And then we all sit around for, you know, maybe two, two weeks in advance, we get it. We all come up with ideas of things we think Paul should do. Um, and, and we'll figure out how many mo motion control arms we can fit into that space. I mean, because it could be 10. I mean, we could really, if we hung some of them from the ceiling upside down. I mean, I so wouldn't many. hang my lights like that because a pantograph, you have to manually move that up and down. Put it on an arm. I mean, that's just common uh, sense. Yeah, put, put the lights on a motion control arm. And you can program them. <laughs> you have know, the remote control arms with like lights. controls for the arm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, it, it'll be a fun project. Jeff, did yeah. you have a last comment? Yeah, you I did. Make? In all seriousness, though, uh, one of the things that we put in, in place in our MCR, it's not, I don't call it a studio, but it's our MCR. I, I can't show you a live picture of it right now but because we're in, in a session, but one of the things we put into play there that really has been helpful is an HDMI, because all our monitors are HDMI monitors in there. Uh, they're all 4K monitors, but an HDMI router uh, that's a 16 by 16, it's just been invaluable for us to be able to go, oh, I want that TV to be that computer. And uh, that, without having to go back there and go, okay, is it this one? Is it this one? I mean, where all our cables are labeled, but it's just so easy to go to the router and go click, 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 done, and walk away. So, um, thousand to maybe fifteen hundred dollars, I think, is what I paid for the one I got. And it was just a generic off. Of, uh, this was a generic off at of Amazon, and it it has worked great. Uh, so I, I would never 
never think that, oh, I'll just use this setup as this is. You'll always want to go, I would rather have this source over here or I'd rather have this over there. And it's a lot easier to do that with a router. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is from Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri. And Vic asks, uh, did you know Walmart is selling the M1 MacBook Air for six ninety nine? I actually did know that. Alex, what do you think about it? It's pretty exciting. There's a couple things that are exciting about Walmart that I didn't realize until this question came up. So, um, so if you look at it here, the, the, this is the entry level. They're basically dumping these uh, these these M ones because the the M the uh, higher M series are in are out now. The M twos and I think M threes um, airs are all available. So of course they want to just get rid of these M ones. And so they're six ninety nine. As a little, I mean, I wouldn't be scared away at all. This is you have to be careful. It's two fifty six uh, gigs of of hard drive and eight gigs of RAM, and you will not be able to upgrade that. Um, but but it is you know for a little walk around um, like producer laptop uh, having a couple of those that's a pretty good uh, cost very cost effective thing to do. The other thing that I saw because I was I wonder what they're selling Mac Minis for, um, and uh, and and I looked over here. Not only do they have you know they have pretty good deals on these Mac Minis again. Small Mac Mini is only five seventy nine, so you can actually save a little bit of money on that. But more importantly, I looked at this one hundred and twenty three dollars for um, you know some 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 uh, late. 2014. So these are refurbs that I just didn't realize you could buy refurbs from from uh, Walmart. And as you scroll down, some of them are really inexpensive. There's $109 um, here. There's one that was one that was like $98 here. Hold on. Oh, 60, <laughs> $68. Now, you may be wondering why would I buy a $68 machine? Um, as a web browser, a clock, uh, you know, like things that you can program. It's basically like a Mac-based Raspberry Pi. That, you know, don't think of it as a, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a little refurb Mac. Just think of it as a Mac uh, a OS, a Mac OS-based Raspberry Pi. And um, the ability to, I have a bunch of these, and I use them for all kinds of little things. But again, like little web pages. Oh, I want to put a clock up here, or I want to run something there it it's uh it's pretty useful so there's a i i'm probably going to buy a couple of those because mine are some of mine are took a couple too many falls <laughs> but being able to so so i was kind of amazed that you could do that it's great jeffrey powers you want to get in on this yeah absolutely the uh, m1 is great uh the m2 actually uh m2 uh error is actually 849 for their base unit so if you've got that extra 200 dollars, i do that when i go on travel uh especially for production i do a one-two punch my for uh, and that is the uh, laptop and the mac mini and yeah looking at the uh, mac mini m2s are now 499 on places like Best Buy, I might uh, I might just uh, upgrade from my M1 and do that because that's the that's the machine that's going to do all the major horsepower work, uh, edit doing the editing and doing everything like that. Add it with a, a small little port portable router, and then you've got and, and the router that I have also has VLAN uh, to it uh, and and, uh, and protection to it, so I can uh, I can talk back and forth. I can do the editing and then I can disconnect it from it and then use the uh, Mac Air as a you know whatever I need you know surfing, video watching, or anything like that. But I wouldn't do too much high end production on the M1, as Alex said. Guy Cochran. Yeah, I have a little PC laptop that yesterday I was using to control um, a another computer that had uh, 1920 by 1080 screen resolution. So I'm curious what that 13 inch screen resolution is because on this uh, laptop that I have, I couldn't, you know, it's having to rescale. But uh, when I was talking to Felipe Bayes the other day in a, a Zoom, he has a very powerful laptop uh, that he had brought to NAB last year. And I was like scared for him. It's one of the eight terabyte models. You know, he's cruising around with this $8,000 laptop. But then as I was talking to him on this call, he's like, oh, I'm just using my MacBook Air to control that computer. It's in another room. So think about these $699 laptops to control other machines. So you could be sitting on the couch waiting for your Final Cut render to finish and you're just checking it. You know, you just use Apple Screen Share and you just go over there and you can say, oh, export, oh, drag that file over to YouTube, uh, upload. You know, you don't have to even get up. So think of these machines as, as terminal access. So it's a, uh, you can have your own local cloud or you could use, you know, other people's machines, but that's another use case for them as long as they have the, the b bigger screen resolution. If anybody Great. knows if they have 1920 by 10. Great point. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, Peter asks, 
Does the ATEM Mini do HDMI pass-through for audio and video, or am I constrained by the output HDMI port for whatever its capabilities are? Uh, if so, is is it stereo or pass-through? Alex? I think it's pass-through, um, but I also, you are constrained to that HDMI port. There is no other password um, pass-through, so it's just, um, uh, there's no pass-through. Yeah. There okay, go. there you go. Let's move on. Next question is from Rayon Smith in Trinidad, West Indies. And Rayon asks, uh, check out the Comica Audio AD Caster C1 cool portable audio interface at a low cost. I wasn't able to take a look at this. Alex, did you get a chance to see yeah, I, what, what's going on here? Yeah, I looked at it. Um, you know, I think that, again, we'll, we'll co keep coming back to cost of the cost of acquisition is not just the cost of uh, it's not just the cost of the device itself. It's the cost of what it takes to set it up. It also is the cost of if it fails. Um, so you got to keep all those costs involved when you think about something being inexpensive. Uh, I probably, you know, this might be something I fiddle with. I don't, I can't even see any personal project I would use it for. Um, it's just, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm sure that it's not going to be quiet. <laughs> like, you know, for audio, like I, you know, I could be blown away that it has some incredible preamps in, in a $99 uh, little device, but I doubt it. And so, uh, so I probably uh, would not probably put this into into a pipeline because I, again, I value my time, and so the amount of time I would take to try to get it to work well, uh, if ever, uh, wouldn't wouldn't be worth it for me. Jeffrey Powers. Yeah, back when Clubhouse came out, a lot of these little devices came out, and uh, th this one seems to be really trying to match what Rode is doing for their uh, for their desktop model, but it's kind of failing short on that. The biggest uh, the biggest thing that I see that's that's uh, that would stop me is the fact that all of the inputs and outputs are three point five millimeter jacks instead of XLR, instead of something you know uh, anything like that. I don't see anything USB. I might be missing it on the uh, on the device there, but yeah, these are definitely uh, were put out as quick as possible so people can get on to the clubhouses and the twitters and the, and the Discord audios and uh, and things like that. Rian Mickey popped into the chat also with stick with the MV. X2U or Focusrite Vocaster to get usable pre's. So that's his opinion. And he knows a lot about this stuff. Let's go on to the next one. Next question. Next question is from Chris Widener in Indianapolis, Indiana. And Chris asks, uh, the OC GoStream deck all-in-one seems interesting and has NDI. Jeffrey Powers, do you know about this unit? It, yeah, well, the GoStream deck has been uh, in my feeds for the last uh, few weeks. I've been definitely switch uh, looking at it. It looks like a pretty decent switcher on itself uh, and in the HDMI and a couple of USB ports, uh, being able to use an SD card to uh, do that. So for a small small switcher and you don't want to pay for the uh, for the Blackmagic uh, ATEM Mini, then this works from there. The NDI part, yes, it does have NDI. Caveat is, and this is, you know, a lot of uh, things, and that is it will do only one single NDI input. So if you're looking to do multiple cameras, then uh, that's, this is, this won't work for that. You'll have to have something external that will bring in one NDI feed into the uh, into the system and then switch from another device. As for the case itself, if if that's perfect for you, that's that's great. But for me, usually when I get something that's an all-in-one system, I end up starting to take it apart because I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to uh, reroute something or anything like that. So I try not to buy all-in-one cases unless I can actually take it apart and I can fiddle around with it because no two, no two uh, uh, streaming or recording uh, situations are alike. Guy Cochran. Yeah, I watched uh, some of these influencer videos uh, showcasing this one. I, I do like the um, case at the bottom, how it has a quarter 20, so you could put it on a on a tripod. But, you know, they're trying to knock off the the Blackmagic ATEM line. And some of the things that they don't realize that you could do with the ATEM, I, I mean, there's just a, a wealth. Of, if you plug it into a, a network, you can use other panels. You can let other people uh, do your graphics. There's a whole ecosystem there. And then the NDI sure it's cool but is it ndi hx yes it's not full ndi so even the director mini it's cool as as it is it's not getting ndi full ndi until uh well a few days from now for nab so there's there's certain 
uh, cameras out there that will uh, benefit from full NDI. Some of the bird dogs, the color fidelity is that much richer. Um, so be careful when you see these terms tossed around that uh, it's the full meal deal and not just giving you a, 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 a more latent signal because NDIHX is more compressed. So you're, you're adding latency and you're throwing away color with NDIHX. So just be careful about what you're, what you're getting into the ecosystem. And then uh, some some of the more popular posts that I've seen on our Facebook group that is about the A10 Mini Pro, if you want to build one of these, pay attention to where your wrists sit. And on that uh, OC model, I don't like the way that the, your wrists go inside of the thing. Uh, some of these builds that other people have done, like this guy Freddie at Pocket Video Studios NY, you can see that the wrists sit a little bit higher. And if you want to build one yourself, um, there's there's other people online that have, like Caleb Pike, that have put up these how-to videos on YouTube. So I'd probably stick to the ATEP line myself. Well, let's go to the next question. Next question is from Zach Stallsmith in Ch Chautauqua, New York. And Zach asks... Uh, I appreciate all the so the solid insight with home studios. I will be continuing to digitize media there, including cassette tapes and vinyl albums. What advice does the panel have to capture that audio as crisp and clear as possible? Nigel's going to start us out here. Nigel? Yeah, so for both cassette tape and vinyl, you can spend a lot of money, um, particularly vinyl, you can buy actually fairly cheaply or you can go the very expensive way and spend fifty thousand dollars on a turntable that you can then put into an audio device it really depends what you're capturing how important the quality is i discovered i had a bag of cassettes of something that was very meaningful to me but wasn't necessarily great quality so i i spent the sum total i think of about 27 dollars a few years ago on this little cassette recorder on amazon uh, which fed out from a cassette recorder into a USB, and it worked really, really, really well. And it captured uh, the long form. There were one-hour radio programs. I captured them. I cleaned them up. I actually did all sorts of things to them. And, and so that was about as good as I was going to get it. But I was storing it for my personal use. I, this wasn't for broadcast. It wasn't for anything else. So really think about what, who you're doing this for, and that should probably help you work out how much to spend doing it. Jeffrey Powers. If you're doing cassette tapes, especially old cassette tapes, especially old cassette tapes that have been sitting in a hot car for many, many years, you want to uh, have uh, uh, some sort of ability to inspect the tape, uh, some sort of ability to, to temperature control the tape. Uh, if some of, the, uh, some of these tapes start uh, showing oxidation, you put them in there, you start digitizing them, you go to the next tape without cleaning the head, and then next thing you know, you've got a ruined uh, uh, project right there. Same thing with the vinyl. Vinyl can warp, so you got to watch out uh, what type of vinyl that you're purchasing uh, to do any type of digitization on, and what type of turntable that you're using for that. Because a warped, a warped record with a with a not weighted, not finely weighted uh, turntable needle will cause skipping, and then you got to start your project over. And of course, you could scratch the vinyl. I agree with all of that. Also, just in terms of vinyl, remember that people played this vinyl back in the day and often they have scratches and other things on them. Thankfully, some of the new tools like Isotope uh, do have pretty decent pop removers that are specifically designed for the kinds of things when you're playing back an LP. So investigate those if you want to try to capture. Uh, cassette was not a high fidelity thing, so you're never going to get pristine CD quality out of an old cassette tape. But you know, good luck with it, and hopefully you'll get the content that you need. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from David Brady in New York, New York. And David asks, uh, I just configured NDI Discovery Server on a Raspberry Pi Pi 3. Um, I, um, uh, I am also running a Pi Hole uh, ad firewall and a home bridge for, for all my different IoT things. Is this pushing it, or is directory server um, a light lift? And Jeff Keithley is going to help you out with this. Jeff? It actually is a really light lift, so you should be in good shape. Guy Cochran, other additional thoughts? Yeah, the other thing to mention is that uh, you can put a comma, and when you put in Access Manager to say where your, your NDI discovery server is located now, now with NDI 5, you can put a comma and you can have a backup NDI discovery server. So if you have any thoughts that, uh, well, it's the worst. When, when, when your NDI discovery goes out, 
you can't see any of your sources. So I always have a second redundant uh, one. So if you have any concerns that that Pi might go down, I would have a secondary backup one and use NDI access management, put that comma, so it'd be 192.168.1.189 and maybe 190, so you have two in that way. And it's super light lift. If you saw what it's doing, it's just like an XML document. It's just saying listening and, uh, and it's just writing the IP address down. It's super, it's like just text. David, I hope that helped. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Aaron Wilson in Lebanon, Tennessee. And Aaron asks, uh, I recently took over our local PEG, that's Public Education Government Access Channel, um, and it's Associated Studio. The studio consists of a 12 by 12 set and a 15 foot green screen wall. How would you light such a space? Ooh, this is, we've talked about lighting green screens a lot, and we happen to have a serious expert, Alex Lindsay, about lighting green screens. I will uh, say the perennial, it depends. <laughs> so, so we, we don't, we don't, I don't know. I, so, so here's here's the thing. Is if you're building home studios like this, uh, I, I can't promise we would accept every one of these, but definitely uh, something like with Paul's and the same with you, with Aaron, taking over one of these spaces. My recommendation is, um, get a, you know, get something like Polycam, take, you know, build a 3D model of it, take a bunch of photos and let's figure out when we can schedule you for a second hour and we'll all sit around brainstorming with you. Because um, I think it's, these are the things that I think a lot of people that watch our show would love to see us do is just kind of, this is what I would do with that set. Um, but if you, if you, um, if you can give us a model and a, and some photos and, and, you know, what, what you have there, I, I think these are great second hours. I'd love to make more, more second hours like this. So, let us know. I mean, in general, what you're looking for is it's not really, you know, the studio, of course, you have, um, you know, we'd have to see it, but, you know, you, you want a grid, you want to be able to have big soft lights with, uh, you know, it's more of not what you what I would use for a green screen wall, but what I want, the result I want is a nice flat wall, you know, so the flat lighting is generally large sources um, that are, but you need to be looking at them through scopes so that you can understand exactly what gets you that flat wall. Um, and, and so it's, it's less about the lights and more about how you use them. Yeah. And in my experience, I've walked into maybe 20 of these kinds of studios. I'd have nowhere near the experience Alex does. But I've, when I've walked into them, I always think to myself, what are they trying to do here? And a lot of them are trying to keep a very high key look. They want a big white wall and a big kind of big field of light. Others, I look up and I say, well, now why did they put in those big lanterns that have black bottoms on? And I realized after a time, they're trying to direct the light toward the psych or the key surface so that it has one level, but protect the stage at another level so that they can light people more interestingly and not just have a big wash of light. So it can be very delicate to, to work on something like this. I agree with Alex. I think it'd be a fascinating hour to just talk about various approaches to large scale green screen kind of work. Let's go to the next question. Uh, next question is from Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York. And Zach asks, Audinate is introducing new features uh, with uh, Dante Connect, utilizing cloud production for A1s and mixing engineers. Uh, with o office hours uh, being covering their, will office hours be covering their booth at NAB? You know, you'll be able to affect that a little bit by getting those questions in during our live coverage. But Alex, what do you think? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> We're definitely covering them. Uh, I've had a bunch of great conversations with Audinate about this. Um, you know, uh, Eric Hertz, who's in our in our, uh, in our our community, put me in touch directly. I had been pinging evidently the wrong places at, at Audinate and not really getting a lot of response. Now I have, I'm talking to everybody there. <laughs> so so we'll, we're definitely going to have, um, uh, we'll definitely have them over either over to our booth or we'll go over to their booth, uh, one or the other. Um, but we're definitely going to talk to them. We're also talking about, you know, how we can do a, a variety of education programs within office hours. So stay tuned for that. But we're, we're definitely going to be doing a lot of work with Audinate over the next year. Jeff Keithley. Can't answer the question about NAB coverage because that's still to be determined a little bit. And, and as Alex said, I'm, it's probably going to happen. Uh, I can say that I actually, one of my best friends is the product manager for Connect. So I'd be glad to uh, oh. wrangle his arm a little bit and uh, bring him along. Um, we've been doing some pretty cool stuff together with it. Uh, there's just a lot coming for, for people out there. It's not the cheapest route, but it's definitely a proven broadcast route and there's some big players coming to play and we should, uh, real we, soon we expect to see some pretty good demos at, at nb too so it should be, should be cool yeah. it should be a fascinating year this year be sure to tune in let's go to the next question uh 
Next question is from Ronnie Hofsoy in Tromsoy, Norway. And Ronnie asks, uh, Jeff is live keying his background. Black Magic Ultimate is a nice is nice hardware. What software uh, uh, could you um, would do a decent real time job given the green screen is of good quality and and uh, lit in a good way? Jeff, do you want to talk us through your chain there and what you're doing? Well, first off, it's not keying. This is real. Oh yeah. <laughs> It is. This is real. This is real a real fake. LED yep. wall. I'm not keying at all. So <laughs> it's just it's just an Unreal Engine that's running behind me into an LED wall, but it's not keying technically. So it's this ah. is practical. This is the the What's stuff the that we're working with with a client is. What's the pitch on the a wall? lot heavier. This is a two point nine, I believe, on this one. Oh wow. How, how far behind is it? Uh, six feet, seven okay, feet. That's good. And um, I honestly, honestly don't even have the greatest of cameras. Just one of my uh, Bolin 4K cameras. Uh, but the uh, the lens on it was better than what I could find out of my BGHs, which had a larger sensor. And uh, but it was MFTs on the lenses there. Uh, it was just too wide. I could get the aperture right uh, to really get the fall off I wanted. Uh, none of my other cameras are small enough that I could get between me and the monitor. I have my camera's right in front of my monitor. Uh, I don't have a, a tele. Um, I, I try not. To, I don't know. I just don't want to give up the desk space for just a few hours a day to go through the whole, uh, you know, hidden behind the mirror type uh, setup. But for us, it's this is just me working on a project that I needed to be able to see what I'm doing in Unreal to be able to see how it looks. And this is more the virtual production world uh, that we're working with. Uh, the View Studios is one of our clients. And so they're doing a lot of it. And I just wanted to be more familiar with it. And so that's why I was doing it. Regarding green screen, um, there is a, a guy. A guy, remind me the the group. It's... Um, socially something something socially another socially right? you i believe it is socially you i think that's it yeah their website website uh is i think around socially you somewhere around that you can google it but they have a web series on uh, youtube and i've just fell in love with them they're doing stuff old school green screen and they're doing stuff with uh the black magic hardware and they're using uh tracking and and uh doing the things that are, we're testing here with our, our robotics and such but uh, they're doing it old school with green screen. And if you want to learn a lot, they're great series to learn a lot of. Uh, but now this is real. You know. Jeff, really this getting... is just overall. What are we talking about to create a little set like that with a live LED wall? And that guy? are we talking north of 10 grand? Yeah, 10 to, 10 to 15. 10 to 15? It's cheap. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. a whole lot cheaper for 2.9. I mean, I had... 5.9 that I spent probably 60 grand on uh, for all my boards before. And the last time I bought these were around 20 and for the same amount, actually for double the amount of, of physical space. So the double the amount of uh, space. Well, wait a second. Board. How long ago was that? And how can we expect it to keep cutting in half every couple of years? Uh, that, that was over the course of about five years. Uh, so five years. yeah. Um, just recently, the prices on LED is really, really fun really really fall and uh and they're going to continue to get better and better right now these are um i would say for portable uses they're not useful and that's one reason they're here because uh the 2.9 is just really delicate and the, the what's called the mask is the spacing around the leds it, it really damages really fast whenever you move it around put it in cases out of cases and such so uh, the industry, the the event industry has kind of settled that 3.9 is the magic for indoor and outdoor uh, combo stuff. But there are people out there that are running like Unilumin has a 1.5 that that is a true, I'm sorry, uh, an event style uh, because there's different types. Like at Blue Studio that we helped build the first one, uh, that was a 1.8. And it was all modules you snapped onto the wall. To, it had to be mounted physically to the wall. This is event hmm. style. So that means it has its own case. It's a truss it's kind of thing or something? Stuff. I have a one, I have two. Wait, on this one. Yeah, I do, I do have two pieces of truss behind this with base plates that are helping just spread the weight. But, I mean, it's 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 floor standard and, and uh, supported. I, my ceiling in here is really low. It's only seven and a half feet. Uh, cause I had to do soundproofing to the space that I have above me, but uh, yeah, it, it's been fun and it don't, 
the one thing you can't dis whenever you go to this real real uh type of led setup is the one thing you can't forget about is cooling um i run my ac a lot more now because if i have this running it's it's definitely emulating heat ah so there'll be a cost to the hvac that goes along with the wall yeah uh alex yeah and and the software is capable of it there's just not a lot of good software out there to do that so we used to do this with conduit um which is the software that that i you know helped develop um, you know, or I worked with a developer on and, um, you know, I'll give you, I'll show you this. This is, uh, I can't show you the actual key. I just don't have a picture of it, but this is, um, in Japan and there's the green screen hidden back there and we were getting set up for this. And in that set, we were keying 1080p uncompressed 444, um, on a laptop in 2008. <laughs> and, and as we were keying that the director came over and asked, Will it be as good in post as it is right now? And I said, Yeah, it'll it'll be at least as good as post. And um, and so you you absolutely can get all those details. It really comes down to the quality of the green screen. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited about using Memo Composer to be able to build this I/O because this is what Oliver Breidenbach's working on. And and the thing is, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to work with Oliver on making sure the nodes that we used um, to get that um, are something that we can do. So we. We had a bunch of nodes that we that we use there, but they're all very very basic nodes um, to make this all possible, and um, and so I think that uh, we'll be able to build use that software and get some I/O out of a, a standard Mac Mini that would do you know what you're looking for um, and and build it into a relatively small uh, component. Um, it's not complicated when you do the green screen well, so it's not about the software or the hardware. It's really about the keying. You know, and or not, I'm sorry about the key, about the green screen. So how you light it? Um, when you light it at a high tolerance, um, you can do basic math. You're basically you're averaging the red and red and blue channel and subtracting that from the green channel, and then you're going to do an unspill operation, and then you're you're going to get a great key. Um, you can do a couple things to clean those things up, like building uh, core mats and garbage mats and those things. But all of those are relatively simple math. And so um, I'm surprised, you know, I've thought about building that. Maybe once I finish this drawing program, we'll work on that next. Um, but the the math is not hard. It's the interface that's hard. Everyone makes the interface way too complicated to do simple uh, keys with their with the hardware. But once you have a Mac Mini, you might as well buy, at, the, at some point, you might as well buy an Ultimat. The Ultimats are relatively inexpensive. I would think about working at 4K in the Ultimat. So get a 4K Ultimat key it and then scale it down and that's going to get you past the 422 limitations that um, the ultimates have right now guy cochran yeah and don't forget that the base level a10 minis have a great gear built in for 295 bucks that's based on the ultimate so back in the olden days we used to have to use uh software and it wasn't well you had to spend 20 grand 30 grand 40 grand if you wanted a real 000, ultimate. not that i'm bitter. 33 33,000 dollars i had i spent 444 but only 1080p. <laughs> so. Oh, man. How far we've come. And right now we're going to the next question. Uh, next question is from Douglas Carmichael. And Douglas asks, Guy, you mentioned the layout of the monitor wall is an important part of the studio design. Could an LED wall be used for critical production monitoring like the Barco range? Guy Cochran, what do you think? Um, that's a tough one. I, I, <clears throat> For the for the truck that I was alluding to, you would need a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is you you want to be able to route things to specific places. And if somebody says, "Hey, I want this this uh, computer over on that monitor," replace the preview with the program, you want to be able to swap stuff around. And so, I don't think that's realistic to get a bunch of barcodes to do what a bunch of uh, standard issue monitors could do. But yeah, it's I think routing is the key to the operation, as Jeff was saying. He's got a 16 by 16, which now he's got me scratching my head going, how do I <laughs> put one of those into my system? Because now that I think about it, I'm constantly going, oh, man, I'm out of I'm out of monitors. Uh, I'll just grab another one. But I could have just routed it instead of adding more monitors because that introduces more heat and yeah, then more cooling and more power. And am I going to overload my breaker? So, yeah, there's there's lots of things to think about when you're adding all these monitors besides just the picture. Jeff, weigh in. No. No. <laughs> Simple as okay. that. The resolution is just not there. Um, if if it was 10 feet away, 20 feet away from you, sort of, but in a compared to a truck environment, you, you're doing a broadcast. And, you know, it'd be different if you're just doing mission control type stuff where you just need to see what's happening. You need to have an overview type displays. But if you need to do critical viewing, critical production, 
real monitors are real monitors for a reason. And that's why we use real monitors. Um, I, everything I have, like I said, I have 4K displays. I've got 16 of them on a wall in here or down our, our, our uh, control room. But none of those are critical monitors. Those are just to see operationals uh, information and such. For truly color balancing and doing any critical, it's going to a dedicated monitor that is dedicated to the signal path. So in answer to that, no. But I can say it makes a really nice game of Halo when you do have the guilty. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I would be, school. I'd do I'm a first-person driver, I think. I'd want to be on a racetrack at that scale uh, or get a Vision Pro. Anyway, next question. Next question is for Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. And Peter asks, the base response here is, well, awesome. Uh, is this because we know what we're doing to send to YouTube or is my audio system heavily oriented to base? Uh, yeah. Uh, Peter, right, the yeah. one thing I will, uh, oh, I was, uh, Alex, unless you want to think, uh, the one thing I know is that we spend a lot of time, and Alex has made this a huge priority for this show. We all very, very carefully have kept to a clean audio signal, what we're sending through Zoom. They've worked really hard on the back end, and original sound is on for almost all of us here on the panel so that we can pass along the best possible. But Alex, why don't you dive into this? You created it. Uh, Mickey pointed out there is EQ and multiband compression in the pipeline, so that's that's a big piece of it. Also, uh, we have radio mics that are relatively close to our mouths. <laughs> we had a discussion before this, but it does make a difference, <laughs> you know. So, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, radio mics close to the source um, will sound better than most other mics almost all the time. Uh, people don't use them because they don't want to have them in the shot, but they do sound better. <laughs> like, you know, he said radio mics. And it's a, it's a, I mean, Jeff, Jeff, we can ask, we can put out a vote, which, which sounds better, your mic or my mic right now? And I'm going to bet <laughs> that I win. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, uh, you know, so like just listening to the show, you know, so, so we, we, we argued about this a little bit. You're just playing with physics. You can decide whether you don't want it to see it or not. But when you move a large diaphragm mic close to a source, it will sound better than a smaller diaphragm mic that is further away from the source. And there's no amount of physics that fixes that in, in general. By the way, some people can define radio mics as wireless transmitters. That's not what we're talking about. These are wired radio style broadcast microphones that most of us are using to originally capture our voice. Jeff, do you well, want to you get You could in also this? call them the overbearing, in your face, look at me <laughs> microphone, too. <laughs> it sound better. <laughs> Jeffrey awesome. Powers, what say you? Um, well, Peter's also a musician, so he might not be talking about a microphone. He might be talking about uh, playing guitar over YouTube. And you got to remember, if you tune, you're tuning for a room, if you've got speakers up here, or you're turning for, tuning for your headphones, but then you have to tune for YouTube. So that'll be that could be a different uh, configuration on your EQ. Yeah, and I will just say I switch mics three times a day because I move from this mic, which I use for this show because it cuts through a little better, to my Neumann TLM-103, which I use for all my voiceover and audiobook work, and then back to this for later when I go back on Zoom for other things. So microphones and the whole process, everything adds something or takes away something from the process. So for most of us, it's getting everything as right as possible. And I, kudos to Alex for being concerned about that from day one here on office hours and moving us all into putting out the best signals we could so that as zoom and everything else developed we were able to have really good audio through the entire pipeline let's go to the next question next question is from eduardo augustine in panama um panama uh and um is it Panama, Pete? I'm confused. All right. No, it's so, Panama um, country. It's not Panama, Panama. Panama. But it's, it's, okay. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, and Edward, Eduardo asks, uh, currently combining vMix for replay with ATEM Mini Extreme and capturing PTZ cameras. Uh, currently uh, using another ATEM Mini to capture a cam to vMix, um, but USB-C is a bottleneck. Um, uh, which would be the best approach without bottleneck if no NDI cam? And we're starting with Jeffrey Powers. Jeffrey? I'm wondering why you're using that second ATM, ATEM Mini, because it just seems that you're, you're bringing, you have to be bringing an HDMI into the ATEM Mini to send USB signal out to the vMix, whereas you could do some sort of uh, a 
a capture card, I suppose that would still be USB, depending on what type of system that you have there that you're sending it to. Uh, if you if you want to get rid of the USB-C, you're going to have to get some sort of internal, uh, if it's a desktop for vMix, an internal capture card that would then go. Or you could get a Mage, something like the MageWell that does HDMI in, to NDI and then use NDI that way and completely get rid of the ATEM uh, Mini if the only thing that the ATEM Mini is doing is that one thing. Jeff Keithley. And it sounds like you're overcomplicating the, the signal flow uh, considerably. When it comes to replay, it's it's very particular about uh, everything keeping the same frame rate and no breaks, no no bibbles, no bobbles. So a capture card, DA every source that's going, if you're going into your mini extreme, DA every source or use a matrix if you are router type thing if you needed to but DA every source so just split every source and go into your switcher if you want to then go in your replay into a capture card don't try to go through another switcher that's just adding more trouble Guy Cochran yeah I was curious as to what system he was using uh, I was going to suggest the same thing I'm, I'm using a sonnet box with a black magic capture card so that way I can go thunderbolt into this laptop that doesn't have uh, you know the ability to put a card inside of it so it's just a sonnet box going into vmix and that way uh, I'm not getting that error when I try to add another USB the other one that I've seen a lot of folks get is this thunderbolt um, AJA uh, model that's it's big bucks but if it depends on if you're being portable and where you where you're going and what you need to do but that's a, another option is uh, thunderbolt insta to capture your sources sdi or hdmi let's go to the next question next question is from roz humphreys in comox uh, uh british columbia and roz asks uh, love my uh macbook pro but the number of outputs are bad my cal digit hub is dropping my drives regularly any suggestions start with nigel Dissau. nigel so a big fan of OWC. I have found some of the docks to have just too many connections I never use. So I tend to go to the hubs. This is my favorite hub, which is the Thunderbolt hub of theirs. If you want the dock, they actually do a mini dock, which uh, gives you USB and HDMI and a network. But I've found that uh, these 57 different connections on these uh, hubs mostly are unused to me. So I, I try and stick with those, and I've always had good experiences. Uh, Alex. Another big fan of OWC. I actually have some of the larger hubs, and I still fill them up. <laughs> so, so I fill them all. I have, the, I have the hub, and then I, and then I, you know, I have like, I think it's not 57. If it had 57 ports, I might not fill it up. But right now, I think I have one with 14, and they're all, all the wires are coming out of it. So, um, so I think that, uh, you know, looking at those larger hubs or the smaller one that, but what you want to be looking at is stability and throughput. Uh, we've had a lot of trouble with the CalDigits to the point where we stopped using them. So the, the CalDigits are not something that I would put anywhere in any system at any time at this point. Um, they're just not, we just haven't found them to be stable, especially with audio and video. Jeffrey Powers. Yeah, I totally agree on that. Uh, the two that I always recommend, OWC and then Pluggable makes a, a Thunderbolt 4 dock that works really, really well. In fact, I have it sitting on my desk right here, which I use for my iPad and then I, my MacBook uh, Pro when I uh, when I plug it in there. Uh, the other thing is uh, if you're if you're putting devices, to, if you're just closing the, the lid and opening it up, uh, sometimes that all will always happen. You'll have uh, disconnects, so it's best to uh, kind of uh, sometimes reboot the machine. So keep that in mind if, if you're putting your uh, machines to sleep, closing the lids. One more thing I'll note, it, you know, you can connect a lot of things to a MacBook Pro. You've got uh, usually three, sometimes four ports, and they'll tell you how many monitors you can drive. I've run into a couple of circumstances where people are trying to drive three or four monitors. It's saturating all the bandwidth, and then they're trying to put another hub on top of that and run a bunch of drives and things out there and the system just gets starved um you know, also i have another i have one of the little owc travel docks and this thing has been really solid for me out in the field so they have a lot of different peripherals with a lot of different capabilities and there is some matching to how much do you have to drive and how much capability does the dock have so think about that let's go to the next question Next question is uh, from Tlaloc Lopez Waterman in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Tlaloc asks, uh, can you have NDI and NDI HX2 or 3 simultaneously on the same network slash VLAN? Jeff Keithley. 
Of course. Absolutely. Not okay. Well, that's pretty simple. <laughs> Jeffrey? Yeah, I, I totally agree. The, the big thing is I, you know, I use the say obsbot tail error for a lot of secondary shots, not primary shots. And then, of course, my main cameras are running a, a, a full NDI uh, from there. So it, it you, de you can definitely do it. Uh, and sometimes it'll save, especially if you've got uh, the switches that are only running one gigabit per second. Uh, then then you have you, your network travel is going to be a lot less for those cameras that really don't need the bandwidth to do that for just some simple shots. Guy Cochran? And if for some reason you have NDI HX1 stuff, uh, that won't show up, but uh, you can use NDI Bridge to find those things and then flip them around on NDI Bridge and then kick them out to NDI HX2 or 3, and that way you'll be able to see those sources. So some of the old NDI sparks and stuff won't work anymore unless you use Bridge. Uh, oh, Jeff popped in at the last minute here. Jeff? Dude, I got some real old NDI stuff. I mean, I, there's stuff like it was almost four years old now, and uh, yeah, it still works. Yeah, Is equipment work. work like dog years? Every year equals seven years in human life. Or well, it feels like, like forty, actually. More forty. Like it, but, uh, <laughs> no, I have I have original Sparks. They still work. We still plug them on the network. They still look like crap, but I, I still use them every once in a while just for extra cameras and stuff. They do work. Okay. There you go. But it, it's the transcoding oh. from uh, NDI HX to like a full NDI. So some of the full NDI boxes, like a, a bird dog. Uh, well, it all depends on your destination. So yeah, I, I'm, exactly. I'm going in in either Sienna Process Engine or I'm going into a, a, a TriCaster uh, most of the time. So it, yeah, I just plug it in and it shows up. Uh, so it, no problem using the older Sparks too. But yeah, any of that network, it, they purposely made NDI to be backwards compatible. So they, they were keeping that in mind. So they're not sunsetting older, old, old, old hardware. Now, the one thing that does make a difference is if you're using Discovery Server or not. Some of the very first Sparks, which we do have some, they don't support Discovery Server. So it, then at that point, you have to have MDNS working on your network. So that's a key. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Brian Stark in Nottingham, and Brian asks, what would be your recommended replacement pay once apps if and when Affinity goes to a subscription model following its acquisition by Canva? This made big news a couple of days ago, and I, boy, I read two or three things from uh, Affinity and Canva about what they are or are not going to go. Alex, what are your thoughts? Yeah, they have, after being a little bit... Uh, cloudy about what they said they got real clear and said we're not getting rid of the the pay once model so it does appear that they're going to keep that at least as one feature so it doesn't sound like you're going to have to pay pay into that my guess is is that they're going to add this as an added feature to one of the higher um, product lines for the subscription for canva so if you buy more than the base package you get all these with it so while you may if I think what's going to end up happening is you'll still be able to buy it as is. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, I think it's going to change anytime soon. Um, but I think that uh, you will then be able, you'll get it as a package if you subscribe to Canva. Um, so I think that that's probably how that's going to work. And if Canva can charge $5 more for their user base, they'll literally pay off the cost of acquisition, uh, of acquiring um, Serif every year. <laughs> like it's a really good investment for them, even if they keep on selling it to the current um, uh customers as is. So it's a good deal for both of them. It's going to be a good deal for us, I think, as well. I, it doesn't sound like they're going to get rid of that. If you did do that, Pixelmator is probably the next one on a Mac, um, you know, that, that that a lot of us would look at. There's also one called Spline that does let, let you do, um, you know, some of the drawing, but there's not a lot of good options uh, after Adobe. But I don't think, again, they've been very clear now after a lot of us was like, eh, they're not really saying which way. They've been very clear now. They're not getting, they're not going to the subscription model. Yeah, and Canva made such a big splash in the creator markets out there with their packages of kind of pre-built things that you can do stuff with. The fact that they have bought a product line that was kind of felt to be a step above means that they're serious and they're going to they're gonna be a player. So it'll be really fascinating to see what's going to happen. Jeffrey Powers, do you have a thought about this before we move on? Well, I would suggest that you should start doing some shopping. I've seen some programs where they say, yeah, we're not going to get rid of your lifetime model. And they don't. But then they go to a 2.0 system. And with that 2.0 system, it, that becomes subscription. And as long as they have their licensing servers uh, set up, Wirecast, perfect example. As long as they have their licensing servers uh, uh, staying up, then you can use the older software. 
But the second they turn those licensing servers off, then you're not using it. And they could they could just they could do it tomorrow or they could do it uh, a year from now uh, without any type of warning. So, yeah, definitely do some shopping around just in case. Life has risks. Let's move on to the next question. That no risk. Next question is from David Brady in New York, New York. And David uh, asks, at the Sunday place, I have an, ex an ATEM Extreme ISO. Is it possible to migrate, export, import some of the MixFX super source animations to native ATEM macros? Hmm. Alex, what do you think? Nope. <laughs> because nope, uh, okay. what it's doing is, is it, so what, what they're doing is it's making those calls directly. So it, it becomes the brain for the ATEM. It's not telling the ATEM that it wants to do necessarily uh, this animation. It's, it's sending the commands that it needs to do to make that happen. So it's not even, I don't think it's, it's talking to the ATEM in its native language, um, but it is not um, doing it in a way that the ATEM would do it. So that's why it's so important to have, uh, to have that mix effect. And of course you can use that on an iPad. A lot of times we also use it on M1s. Um, so you can make that available and then you just have a computer that's connected to it. Well, let's see if we can sneak in one more question here. Uh, next question is from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas asks, has anyone tried Sonobus to transmit, receive audio over the internet? Guy Cochran. Yeah, Oliver Breidenbach and I were in a Zoom session. We were trying to figure out some audio stuff, and he's like, oh, just use Sonobus. And I was like, what? And so I installed it really quick on my Mac, and he had it running, and he was sending audio to my computer from Germany, and I was just blown away that it was free. I was like, this is fast and free, so it's worth taking a look at. I didn't dive too much into it, but it works, uh, and it, it's no, no cost. It's donationware. Cool. Thank you very much. And for everybody for being here as a part of this. I neglected something earlier. I was talking about our coverage of NAB and I didn't mention Zoom and I really should because they have really stepped up and they're helping support the office hours endeavor at Zoom in a huge way. So we are truly appreciative. The fact that you'll be able to see live coverage from the floor and that we will have bandwidth and internet connectivity is largely because they've stepped up and helped us support that. So thank you to the Zoom team very, very much on behalf of all of us at Office Hours. We have also always a moment to thank our producers, those who come into the panel, uh, uh, those in the back end who ask the questions, who submit things and really drive the entire run of show. This isn't possible without what all of you do all around the world. And it amazes me every day I sit here and every day that I'm on the panel, how many people from around the entire globe stop by here to ask their questions and help drive our content. So thank you so much for that. For the panelists who come up every day and answer the questions, just truly, freely, no no charge, just show up and expert and, and donate their expertise so that maybe we can help people get over the kind of uh, humps in their career that we all had to come over. We didn't have a place to come and ask questions like this. Thank you very much. And every time we do this, we make sure we acknowledge the, the small army of back-end crew people who are behind the scenes working in all sorts of ways, working on the website, working on the Q&A system, booking guests, and doing all the things that they do that makes this show possible every day. We appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much. We traveled 76,000 miles on the Telec Traversal today. It's 123,000 kilometers. If you were to lay bananas end to end, 604 million bananas for scale. Thanks for watching the show. We got to remember to like bring our more. to NAB. I like we traveled more than than we uh, than than the number there. I feel like that was a low number. I thought we were going to England. Yeah, seventy six thousand. We're, we're, we're going to the UK, and then we're going to uh, Jamaica, and then we're going to. I feel like there's something wrong with that count. Panama. We went to Panama, 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 the country. That's right. Um, we went to we went to New Zealand a couple times. I'm confused. I think that that number is. I think that number is very low. Somebody's thought, been eating the bananas. Someone ate the bananas. Maybe exactly. we dropped the That's digit. The problem. There's they a banana hungry. conspiracy. Needed potassium. Uh, uh, Jeffrey's very much into the banana conspiracy. I have a <laughs> banana every day. I think, I think this is all being run by the Banana Republic. Not the cl <laughs> clothing company. <laughs> no, a banana. 